How is everyone today? Well, I had a very interesting day today, I don't know about you, but this morning we, myself and Mary decided to hit the beach as we normally do when we go to Mooloolaba and, uh, and I, after about three or four body surfs, <laughs> got stung by a jellyfish. Um, and it was ironic because before I went down to the surf, um, I was actually a, processing an emotion about getting attacked and, uh, and, um, and in the process of that I didn't actually connect to the emotion and I got a bit frustrated so we went down the beach instead <laughs> and got attacked. <laughs> so I spent most of the day sitting uh, at home uh, with my feet in vinegar <laughs> trying to take the pain away. I had one time where this happened before in my life and I got uh, stung right all over my body and uh, I decided not to put myself with vinegar or anything like that and I spent nine hours in agony dealing with the pain of it, just feeling the emotions of being attacked basically. But today I decided I knew what it was. No, I'm not clear of it. So I'm going surfing again tomorrow, so <laughs> we'll see what happens tomorrow. Um, there's a few little housekeeping things we'd like to do. Um, myself and Mary are thinking of actually having one session in Brisbane uh, a month and then one session down on the Gold Coast a month. Um, now, we, we want to ask you what you would prefer... See, what we were thinking of doing is going to do the session at Butterham. Once a fortnight, we're going to be doing the sessions at Butterham. And then come straight from Butterham to Brisbane on the Monday night following uh, the Butterham session. And, um, and then, then a fortnight later, doing another session at Butterham, but, but this time going from Butterham down to the Gold Coast for the Monday night. That's what we were thinking of doing. And we were just wanting to ask whether... Uh, that's too much for everybody or whether they'd like the Brisbane sessions separate to the Butterham sessions or, or what. It just means for us that it reduces our travelling because we travel three hours every time we come across, uh, three hours one way every time we come across to do a session. So that's what we were thinking of doing. So if you have a think about that and... Uh, and I guess you will go where you go. Yeah. <laughs> so how many would feel it would be better if there wasn't... See, we were thinking at one stage of doing Brisbane and then going straight down to Gold Coast and doing Gold Coast the next night. But the problem with that is, is anybody who's been to Butterham and then wants to come to Brisbane, then you've got four nights in a row and it gets a bit heavy. Uh, it's already heavy enough with one, one session, most people feel. <laughs> so, um, so we thought we'd probably break it up like that. Um, that sounds all right. So the people that can't get up to the sessions in Butterham obviously get a chance still once a month to come along to sessions either in the Gold Coast or here in Brisbane. So does that sound all right? Yeah. yeah. yeah? Um, uh, is it, who would like to handle the microphones? One, one at the front if we can, or one near the front and one near the back. Thanks, Peter. And one up the back somewhere. Thank you, Graham. And what would you like to ask? <laughs> Sorry, um, if you can speak through the microphone so I can hear it too. Hi, Aitu. Do you make just the weekend at the Gold Coast or just an evening? It'll probably be just an evening, probably a Monday evening um, okay. at the Gold Coast. Um, the reason why is that um, if, I, if I use up too many of our weekends, myself and Mary don't get enough free time to actually do our emotional processing work that we need mm -hmm. to do. So what we were thinking, and uh, one other thing we we're thinking of doing too is Mary's going to probably start doing some, one, some, some of those small se those sessions uh, that she was talking about yeah. where um, she'll be basically doing, at this stage it's looking like it will be a 15 hour type of in intensive thing trying to help you if you're blocked with emotion. Um, I'll just uh, try and address this. Uh, and... and um, so what that means then is that we would come from our house across to Butterham, do a weekend, and then Mary would have a chance to do uh, her sessions during that weekend the following week. We'd be able to actually do, Mary fills up to 40 people during those following weeks 
in between the two fortnights, if you like. And uh, so, so what that means is that we can travel over here, stay over here for a fortnight, do all of those different things, and then go back home and process for a, the, the other fortnight of a month. And that gives us some time to, uh, private time as well, to work our th way through things. Uh, I have another question. <laughs> go far away. I just have the mic. So uh, I'm, I'm living around Byron Bay. And uh, would, you, would you and Mary would like to come down there and give a weekend down this area? Um, is there a possibility? Or we, we will go anywhere where there's a group of people, usually around 20 or more people. But the problem for us is that we've got to take slots of time away from other things to do that. So, so we will be going back up to Mackay, for example. We will be get, doing another trip down the coast, right the way down to Coffs Harbour and then across to Armadale and then back up. But those kind of trips probably will only be happening once every three or four months um, mm -hmm. rather than on a regular basis because otherwise myself and Mary don't get any time to do our own emotional work, which we still want to do. So. Because you have never been down this... This era down there, I've never heard. I have that. been down there. Uh, and you gave a, um, a week? No, 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 because uh, the the some areas are more natural love than other areas. It is and, very natural. And Byron <laughs> Bay is a very natural love sort of area, <laughs> um, and so we find in those kind of areas there hasn't been as much uh, demand to talk about divine love. And everybody, when we do talk about divine love, they think we're talking about natural love. Um, so, um, but, but again, that all depends on demand. What we've found is that if there's a core group of people who have gotten onto the divine love path, processing their emotions and, and working their way through all the other issues that are on the path too, what finishes up happening is that attracts a whole group of people in that location. Yeah. So, so in any location, that's probably what's going to happen. And obviously, myself and Mary have a limit of our own time and what we can give in our own time and still do our own emotional work. So, mm. so that's what we're trying to balance at the moment as well, so that we can spend time, because we've still got quite, I've still got quite intense emotions to work through about some things, and, and I need time away by myself to deal with those particular issues. So, so, uh, <laughs> so yeah. for example, if, um, because I'm very passionate to talk about the divine love past, and I know quite a some people in this era, because I've been yep. living there. So and my, I feel it would, if that would be a possibility and... Um, well, next time we go down to Coffs Harbour, because we drive down, uh, we could certainly do a, do a session at Byron Bay. Um, but, but let's yeah. see what the law of attraction yeah, brings us. I'm, I'm, I'm also yeah. with the law of attraction, but somebody mentioned it and I thought, yeah. Yeah. It's also important for this place, I yeah. think, really. So what, what, what we found is that Harvey Bay, too, is a very similar area in some ways to, in terms of natural love, and we just visited there the last week. Um, so, so we get to visit a lot of those locations, but what we find is that um, it, unless people have actually watched quite a number of the DVDs first, there's not that much of a, uh, of a demand to actually go there because of the people are still resisting their emotional work. And so there's, we find if we go to a place where there's a hot, heavy resistance of emotional work, what happens is that basically it, 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 we use up a lot of time doing it, but, but there's not too many results in terms of the people that are helped. Yeah. Yeah. Peter, you had a question? Uh, when I was talking to Mary recently, she was saying you were planning to go to New Zealand and Adelaide and few other areas. Yep. Could, could you share with us what, what those plans are? So just in case we've got people there that we could... Um, and well, yeah. to Adelaide is just a personal trip that I've got to go to sort out and finalise my... Uh, close, I'm closing down all of my uh, business stuff from years ago and there's been outstanding things of that for some years now and so I've just, we've got to go there to close all those things down so that's what we're doing. And then um, the uh, New Zealand trip has already been organised with uh, and and we have a we're doing a session in the North Island um, I forget what date that is. I think it's 27th of uh, February I think uh, from memory and um, and then we're doing a session uh, in the South Island on, on a weekend time as well down near uh, Glenorchy which is down near um, uh, Queenstown down near Queenstown yeah so um, 
So that's what will be happening there. And we've also, there's been a lot of people asking us to go overseas, uh, which we obviously don't have the funds to do. But we've sent out an email to people overseas uh, that if they'd like to help contribute with the funds, then we're willing to go. And, and quite a number have come back saying um, there's with enough funds to go on a trip around. So it looks like sometime in July we'll be going for maybe up to two months um, from to the USA and then uh, down probably uh, to, to quite a number of places in the USA and then down to Florida and then up to England and then across to Sweden and, and Greece and then back, back home. So uh, that's where the demands are at the moment for us to go. So, yeah. So at the moment we're sort of, what we're trying to do is balance all of that with still doing our own stuff as well. Yeah, so, so it gets a bit tricky sometimes. This month we planned poorly and we've only got six days <laughs> by ourselves this month. So, um, so we planned pretty poorly this month, but generally we're trying to get at least a week and a half to two weeks uh, where we've got some time by ourselves and then what, what we can give after that. With the, Mar with the sessions that Mary's planning, uh, she's planning enough sessions that 120 people can come to. So, um, and she's going to send out an email shortly about the type. Uh, some of them are going to be just all evenings and one day on a weekend. So for those that are working or whatever else that want to come along. And then another session is going to be just two and a half straight days, basically, um, in, in a week, uh, in, in midweek, sorry. Uh, at this stage, the first two sessions will probably be in Butterham, uh, but we're not certain as to whether all of them will be there, um, certainly, uh, because we may finish up travelling with them. So uh, that's what Mary's planning, and that, that'll probably begin in the first week in April, because the first week in April, believe it or not, is only two months away <laughs> from today. So that's what's happening anyway. Um, is there anything else you'd like to know what's happening about? No? Just up the back there with a... Sorry, I, I, if you can speak into the mic there. And, yeah. when, you go overse when you go overseas, are you still going to be taping? Um, what happens when we go overseas is we can't carry all of our recording equipment with us. Um, obviously, um, it's pretty difficult to do that. So we're quite reliant on people overseas recording. And so not all of them will be recorded probably, but we will certainly try to voice record them at least and put them on the internet. Um, but that's not always possible either, depending on the locations that we're in. Uh, so unfortunately, it means that you may have a two month blackout when it comes to <laughs> hearing from us, but that's the way it goes. Um, Often, when we, when we go to certain locations, like when we go to Florida, for example, uh, there's a person down there who does all the recording, and, and so anything that we do down there will certainly be recorded. But there will be other locations that uh, possibly won't be recorded. So, mm. and, uh, and it's just difficult to carry around all of the equipment. Um, all the equipment weighs about 50 kilograms by itself, and so it's difficult to carry it around the world. Uh, when you're travelling. And of course a lot of it doesn't run on other voltages anyway, so, so you'd have to buy new equipment. Any other questions about it? No worries. Well, welcome along tonight, everyone. Hope your day's been a little better than mine has today. <laughs> today I wanted to discuss the subject, um, emotions. Truth and judgment. Uh, with an E, is it in Australia, I think? With or without? <laughs> um, emotions, truth, and judgment. The reason why I wanted to talk about this subject is that many people become so afraid of speaking truth because they then feel that they are judging people. Many people also become afraid of hearing the truth because they feel that somebody who's telling them the truth is judging them. And most of the, tr the truth and judgment are, are only going to enter us emotionally anyway. So, so this is why I wanted to talk about the relationship between emotions, 
speaking the truth and then the feelings of being judged or judging others. Now, in the first century, I talked a lot about judgment because judgment is one of the main ways in which you get controlled. So when you think about it from your childhood, every time you got judged for doing something, sometimes you did things innocently, right? So in pure innocence, you went ahead and did something, and then there was a huge amount of anger or rage or other kinds of, and other kinds of emotions, sadness sometimes, and other types of emotions projected back at you because of what you did. And as a result of that in your childhood, you then learned how to act in many cases. So many times you didn't need a belting to be controlled. What you needed instead was just to be judged and then you learned from that judgment what was acceptable from a social perspective or from a family perspective or from a religious perspective or from any of these other perspectives, politically, economically and so forth. Once you, once you get judgment, all of these areas can, can, you can have enter you emotionally, these emotions that cause you to act in a manner that is actually in a very controlled manner, where other people can now control you. Now, we can obviously speak the truth to somebody and judge them in the process. And we can also speak the truth to somebody and not judge them at all. So we need to determine what, what's the difference between speaking the truth and having the feeling of judgment enter me or the feeling of judgment for another person. Now, if we just remember what the soul is, so let's uh, remember we're a half of a soul, so this is my masculine half of the soul, my spirit body, my material body. All right, spirit body, material body, or physical body, and there's my soul. That's the real me, remember? So, what actually happens at the soul level, so if we rub out these things, because these things are just appendages, as we were talking about on the weekend, these are, these are just appendages to the soul. I'm just going to swap this over, so it goes into another one. So now when I go like this, it doesn't make a noise. All right, so, so what, we want to do, what we want to do is look at the type of influences. Now, we all know that there are but many of you who have been along now for a while know that there are two types of influences on the soul. There's the truth influence and the error, the error influence, right? And these influences enter you as emotions. So they enter you as emotions. Now as they enter you, that then constructs within you a labyrinth of emotions. Emotions, some of which are based upon truth, and some of which are based upon error. Let's give you a one based upon truth. One based upon truth might be an emotion where you have in yourself this thing that happens that if you lie, you have this terrible feeling overcome you. Right? So that's an emotion based on truth, because whenever I lie, my conscience then bothers me, and this, there's this soul feeling that comes up in me I've done the, that I've done the wrong thing, and I, need, and I have this feeling inside of me that I need to correct that in some manner. And that's a, an emotion based around truth, where I've got this moral compass inside of myself, and that moral compass motivates me to live in harmony with the truth of it. On the other hand, I've got error-based emotions. One of the error-based emotions might be a truth that I believe about myself, for instance, that I feel that I'm a bad person. And no matter what anybody tells me, you know, somebody can say, well, no, you're not all bad, and you're not, you know, you haven't, what about this? This is a good thing in you, and that, what about that? That's a good thing in you. And it doesn't matter what anybody tells us, we still feel like we're a bad person. So that's an error-based emotion now that's living in my soul that I believe to be truth. So all of these emotions now have entered me. So you could think of your soul, which I'll draw a little differently now. You can think of your soul as this container, right? And the container is full of emotions. What other things is it full of? Desires. Passions, desires, 
intentions. All those kind of things, right? And the soul is full of all of these things, some of which of these things are based upon truth as God sees it, and some of these things are based upon error as God sees it. But from our perspective, most of the time, they're all based on truth. <laughs> so God sees some of the things as error and some of the things are truth, but a lot of times we see them as all truth. Otherwise, we would never have allowed them into us, would we? Unless we would have thought that. So, for example, if I have an emotion in me that I am basically worthless, that I believe to be true, I'll believe that with all my heart. But it's actually an error from God's perspective. But I'll believe that emotion to be true. And I might have another emotion that uh, it's a wrong to lie. And that emotion happens to be in harmony with truth, with, in harmony with the, gay, with the, the way God feels about how we live our life. So, so that emotion then is harmonious with truth. But the problem is, we think that all of the emotions are harmonious with truth inside of us. And often, other people come along and tell us things and interact with us in certain ways that expose the fact that they are actually errors because the only way you can really tell that the soul is in error is due to pain. So when I'm feeling pain, that's an indication that my soul's in error on that particular subject. Does that make sense? So pain is like this indicator. And I'm not talking about physical pain, although physical pain is incorporated in it, but pain itself, emotional, physical, inter spiritual pain, all of those pains are all an indicator that my soul has a belief, an emotion, a passion, a desire, an intention inside of it that is actually based upon error. Because if it was based all upon truth, there would actually be no long-term pain at all. There would be no suffering at all in my soul. Right, so, so we know that's the case. So let's build on that now in terms of what's happening inside of us. Peter, you want how, how does that relate to the jellyfish? The jellyfish? For me, the emotion of error inside of me is this belief that I have that, um, I'm, af that I'm afraid that I will die if I'm attacked. This comes from some first century stuff. And in particular, the, today the emotion for me was related to the feeling of being accused of arrogance. So uh, uh, lately a lot of people are accusing me of arrogance and they don't know whether I'm arrogant or not really, but they're accusing me of it. But in the first century when I got accused of arrogance, seven days later basically I finished up dying from the accusation, even though it was false. Does that make sense? And so I have a lot of this fear, like I was just sitting this, this morning when I started discussing it with Mary and I started feeling this real deep panic and fear come up but I couldn't actually access it fully. And instead of, instead of sitting there and staying in the emotion, right, um, because we have, we've spent now three or four days at Malula Bar and haven't even got out of our unit, <laughs> it's because of emotional processing and stuff, so we decide, oh, we'll go down the beach, and as soon as I go down there and avoid that emotion, bang, there's a law of attraction event showing me what I'm avoiding. Does that make sense? So the pain was the result of the emotion staying within the soul. And it's a physical pain in this case, and straight away I knew what it was about. As soon as I got it, I went, I went back into the surf, just said, oh, let's go home, I want to sit in some vinegar for a bit. <laughs> and as soon as I got it, I knew it was because I was avoiding this issue of being attacked. Does that make sense? Yep. And um, up the back, if we could have a mic. Uh, sorry, I just got to judge this. Um, how does it go for um, errors and pains that you don't seem to be ready to deal with? And there is, every time you're in this pain, so let's just write pain back up there. Every time you're in pain, the truth is that you are ready to deal with it. Right? The, the way God created everything within you is that you are totally ready to deal with every single emotion that's within you. And if you allow yourself to be ready, these emotions will just flow out of you one by one, actually. You'll never be um, totally, like, into it. You, you'll never be committed from, for doing it that way. 
The only time people get into a state where they get emotionally crazy is when they're actually heavily suppressing the emotional process. And we have, the reason why we heavily suppress the emotional process is because we have deep fear about being overwhelmed about our emotions. And so what we do is we start shutting down the soul. Now, as soon as we start shutting down the soul, the physical and spiritual bodies start having problems. So the spirit body now starts having energy flow problems as soon as you shut down an emotion at the soul level. And then the physical body will often then start manifesting a physical ailment as a result of the soul shutting down that particular emotion. And that doesn't mean, though, that you're not ready to deal with it. What it means is that you are totally ready to deal with it and you don't want to at some level. And the don't want to is usually, I'm terrified. I'm terrified of dealing with that particular emotion. All right? So every bit of pain, and, and especially long, longer-term suffering, results from our avoidance of just allowing the process of the full experience of our own emotion. Does that make sense? It makes sense, but um, I've got some other things I'm attempting to wrap my mind around at the same time. No worries. Yep. So, so when, when, um, when we have pain or suffering, the key thing to focus on is, all right, not that you're not ready, because you're always ready, the truth is you can choose to be ready at any point in time. It's just a free will choice. It's not that we're not ready, it's because we're unwilling. And the key is to acknowledge that within yourself. I am unwilling. I don't want to do this. <laughs> I am frustrated with doing this. I don't want to do this. I think God should have made some other way of doing this and so forth. You know, just to let yourself express the truth about how you really feel, rather than saying, yeah, I'm willing, yeah, I'm willing, but I just can't seem to get to it. That's not a truth. The truth is your soul has been built to get to access every single emotion inside of you, and the only thing that's stopping that from happening is your will, your own free will. And if you can bear that in mind, th that you then you then come to see that pain and suffering, even the type of pain that I had today, was my own creation. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think I um, was confused between unwilling and unable. Yep, um, there is no such thing as unable. There is only unwilling. Well, unready, I mean. Like, um, unwilling versus unready, I was confused about yeah, that. Yeah, and I don't feel there's any such thing as not, not ready. The truth is, there is just unwilling. Now, now, the key is to address the unwilling in terms of a fear. And this is where we need to start accessing our blockage type emotions. Because all, all of the unwillingness of our soul to feel what it really feels is based around fear about experiencing those particular things. So we need to start acknowledging our fears. And as we start acknowledging our fears, often the underlying emotions come up quite rapidly after that. So that being said, we'll just rub that out again and get back to the soul. So we've got this soul experiencing these emotions, passions, desires and intentions and the soul is just there feeling its stuff, basically. Now some of that stuff is based on error and some of that stuff is based on truth but from the perspective of the soul, most of the time we begin thinking it's all truth, even the bits that are error. So what finishes up happening then is the way God's constructed her universe, God actually starts now, through the processes of all the laws that she's created, exposing this soul's truth and error state. The way that the laws, that there are a number of different laws that do this. One law you've heard of is called the law of attraction, right? Now the law of attraction is like, uh, attraction is like a messenger of truth Right? that actually tells you when your soul is out of harmony with truth. So I'm driving along the road, somebody cuts me off. Now my soul in its pristine state would never create that condition. Right? And so somebody cutting me off and me starting to feel an emotion from it, I need to look at the emotion. What's the emotion? Well, angry. I'm angry that they've just cut me off. 
So straight away, a law of attraction has exposed an, an emotion inside of me that's based on error. Anger is the suppression of fear, and underneath the fear is obviously some grief that I need to experience in this state. And the law of attraction is demonstrating to me in that particular moment that my soul is in error right there and then. The law of attraction is, one of, is God's primary messenger, if you like, of truth. There's also other laws, though. You've heard of the law of cause and effect? I haven't talked much about that law, but I will in the future. But the, the, basic of, the basic principle of that law is that if you try to change something at the effect level, you'll never be able to do it. It's only when you change something at the causal level that things will change. Now, from the soul's perspective, the causes are all those kind of things. So, so let's say I'm driving along the road, I get cut off, the law of attraction has exposed an emotion in me, anger. Now, I could then realise, oh, I'm an angry person, I'm a bit angry person, every time I drive I seem to get angry, every time I drive I seem to attract people treating me you know, in an unloving manner and I get angry about that. So what I'm going to do about that is meditate for an hour a day and work my way through that issue using that. Now, the pro problem with meditation is it only addresses the effect. And because the cause is actually an emotion in the soul that needs to be experienced to be released. Does that make sense? Something's got caught up there in it. <laughs> um, sorry about that, I just got a bit distracted about it. <laughs> so the cause is an emotion that needs to be released. The effect of dealing with the effect of trying to calm down my anger using meditation doesn't address the cause of my anger. So yeah, I can try to deal with it. So I, will, I can try to deal with that for a year, two years, five years, whatever even go down the road of trying to detune from all desires, but in the end, my law of attraction won't change. My law of attraction will keep bringing me these events, and all I do is I say, all oh, right, now I'm zenned out when I'm driving, right? And the law of attraction is still bringing me the same events that it was bringing me before. And because I haven't changed the cause inside of me as to why the law of attraction is bringing me those events, and only focused on the effect, which was my anger, and calmed myself out of my anger, the cause still exists in my soul, and therefore the law of attraction will continue to operate upon my soul. Right? So you'll still have these events, one after the other occurring, until you address the cause at the soul level. And so the law of cause and effect has many far outreaching effects on, on our soul, a, a, aside from other aspects of our life. Jen? AJ, can the law of attraction be something good? Is it, is it always um, something in error? No, the law of attraction in the end will be always good. So as you release more and more of your, the error-based emotions, more and more of your life will be positive and good. So, so you know how sometimes when we start, we find we've got this nasty person in our life and that nasty person in our life and half the people that we know are nasty to us or whatever. And then once we get through these emotions and start releasing them, all of a sudden things cha start changing around you. And before you know it, every single person you meet in your life is pretty nice. And, and things like that start happening to you. Does that make sense? Yeah. Can and it happen on a, uh, like with an object? Certainly it can. And also with animals and creatures and insects and everything. So, you know, even just such a thing as like getting bitten by mosquitoes is a law of attraction event. And if you address its cause emotionally inside of yourself, you won't get bitten by mosquitoes anymore. Just simple things like that. Okay, well, that's good because I was trying to go through a motion today and I was sitting on the grass in front of the Malulabar Beach and there were ants everywhere, big ones, little ones and that. And I was talking to someone for an hour about an emotion and not one ant bit me and I thought, I think I must be on the right track. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, so what happens is that everything starts to live in harmony with you. So the fact that I got... I stung today meant that I was out of harmony with everything. 
Does that make sense? Otherwise, it wouldn't have happened. And I can see why I was, because in that particular moment, I could feel the emotion that I was suppressing. And, uh, and by the way, still suppressing. So, um, <laughs> so obviously, I don't want to go that one. So, but if we understand the law of attraction is like this messenger of truth, and the law of cause and effect is showing us that if we don't deal with the cause and we just deal with the effect, then, then our law of attraction will not change. So these are good measurements to see whether we're progressing. Now, what happens though is God has available to her lots and lots of things to help you get out of a state of error and into a state of truth. Now, God has all these laws. So there's all these laws that help you do this. Every time you experience pain, you know, I'm breaking a law here, there's some law that I'm not getting here. And, uh, and you can start to investigate that emotionally as to what kind, what's going on. Something, and in the end, they all are based around laws of love. So if, if you break any law of love, there will also always be pain associated with it. So you know the, all the songs that go, you know, the pain songs about love, you know, which are most songs about love on the planet, aren't they? Well, they're all in error, obviously, because any, if you experience any pain with love, then you, there is a lesson of love that you haven't learnt yet. Does that make sense? So what we do is we let ourselves confront all of those things. But God also has other things at her disposal to be able to help us get out of this state of error and into the state of truth. Now, God has all of these spirits in the spirit world who are already developed more than I am or more than you are. Does that make sense? They have all of these spirit, spirits in the spirit world. And these spirits, all of them above the eighth sphere of the spirit world, are, if you long for them to help you, they will come and help you. But a lot of their help is like emotional. So unless you're open to your emotions and your desires and your passions, it's going to be difficult for you to listen or hear what they're actually saying. So what are other mechanisms? Well, other mechanisms are people on earth who have, a little, have the connection to these spirits or to God, that can tell you truth. And that can happen any moment in your life. And in fact, in most cases, your own children are more connected to God than you are yourself. right? Because they have less soul damage and therefore less resistance to their emotions and therefore less resistance to what anybody from external locations can tell them about the truth. And so many times a lot of wisdom can come out of the mouth of your child to you. And the key is, how do you react to it? And this is why I want to get to the, sub, the, the subject of truth and being judged or judgment. Because most of the time we receive truth in terms of through our ears or through our eyes, the majority of the time we judge ourselves with it. Right? And what that causes us to do is to then emotionally reject that truth from entering us. Does that make sense to everyone? And this is a major problem of self-judgment inside of ourself. So let's look at why we do that. Everything, of course, begins at the emotional level. So what emotion would be in us that we would want to avoid that would cause us to reject truth. So the action is to reject truth. What emotion would cause us to reject truth? What kind of emotions? Shame? But it's not the shame, is it, that's causing us to reject the truth, is it? What is it? No, in the, I'm talking about just the emotion of shame at the moment. We'll talk about the other ones. But is it the emotion that, of shame that causes to me re, to reject the truth? Does, isn't it my refusal to feel the emotion of shame that causes me to reject the truth? Can you, can you see the difference between that? The, the emotion itself is shame. Does that make sense? But it's not the shame that causes to me re, re, reject truth because... Somebody could tell me the truth and all I need to do is feel my own shame and will I reject the truth? 
I won't. If I allow myself to feel the emotion fully of shame. So it's actually not the shame that causes to me re to reject the truth. It's actually my refusal to feel this emotion of shame. Can you see that? My unwillingness inside of my own soul to feel the emotion of shame causes me to then reject the truth when it's told to me. Now, we could rub out the word shame and put in any one of the other emotions that you said. We could rub out the word and put in there unworthy. And if I have the emotion of unworthiness, am I going to reject the truth? No, unless I refuse to feel the emotion of unworthiness, then I will reject the truth. Can you see that it's actually... Can we use the microphone? Um, wouldn't fear come into it? Wouldn't fear come into it? Fear. Yes. There's obviously a reason why I refuse to feel this emotion here, whatever that emotion is. And obviously that reason is based upon fear of something. And I would actually go further and say that it's actually based upon terror of something. And denial. Right? And it's the terror inside of us of feeling these emotions, which is our main problem. What Can about denial? Well, all denial is based upon shutting down your fear. So everything, every time you choose to deny something, it's because you're shutting down your fear, and, that, and your fear is the thing that causes you to shut down the actual experience of the emotion that causes you to reject truth. So no matter which way you look at it, the problem is not the emotion existing in me. The problem is my refusal to feel the emotion existing in me. Can you see that? And as soon as I refuse to feel an emotion that exists in me, I will reject emotionally the truth that's coming to me. It doesn't matter what source it's coming from, I will reject it if I refuse to feel all of my emotion inside of myself. Does that make sense? Hello, AJ. Um, for myself these days, I'm, I'm such in terror with men. So I realized a few weeks ago I was really angry with men, which I couldn't see before. Then scared about them mentally and nice physically. And, and my love attraction is like nearly every day I go in terror and I would be in my bed and I and I really think I'm going to be attacked, yep. and I feel attacked by men, yep. and I, I can feel on my body everywhere, and I think I'm open to feel it, because I don't even pray for them to stop, and I don't even pray for some help. I just want to feel it, but it keeps coming again and again and again, and I don't know if that's going to go away. Yep. And if that's what's happened to me, like I, I refuse to feel something when I think I'm opening myself to feel that? Yes, yeah, so can I just explain what we're often refusing to feel is actually positive things. So um, I, I can, I'll give you an example. Um, one, in one of the emotions I've had to process my way through is that love is a gift, right? Now that's a positive thing to say, isn't it? Love is a gift. But you'll be surprised how many emotions are involved in you thinking that love's not a gift. <coughs> and that love can be demanded and expected. Right? So what, I, what would often be happening inside of myself is I'd be crying about not getting love from a certain relationship, and the thing I needed to come to understand was that love was a gift. So my crying about not getting love was actually in error. Can you see that? Now, I needed to cry about it, but if I, I could keep crying about it for 100 years. I needed to accept some kind of truth inside, into me, somehow. And I needed to see why I didn't want to believe love was a gift. So I needed to actually deal with it, a totally different emotion than the emotion that was actually, I felt was actually happening to me at the time, which was, I wasn't getting loved. Right? And the emotions in many cases I had to deal with was that I had these beliefs, in, beliefs inside of me about love that I was refusing to give up. And, I, and my, in my refusal to give up these beliefs, 
I would have huge amounts of pain because I just refused to give up the belief. Now, one of the beliefs that, could, that often affects us is this belief that we're going to be attacked all the time. And a lot of times we refuse to give up this belief. Why would you refuse to give up a belief that you're being attacked, going to be attacked all the time? Can you see there are some pretty deep psychological reasons where that you might have? One might be, if I, if I have a belief that I'm going to be attacked, then I can be hypervigilant. Then I can actually prevent myself from experiencing life by being very choosy with what actually happens in my life. And the way I'll be choosy about it is I can say, I can say, ah, and if I go there, that might happen. So that will stop me going there. So, oh, somebody invites us along to go out dancing, right? But if I go dancing, people will laugh at me because, because I look funny or because I'm no good at dancing or any of those kind of things, right? And so I can say, I can go into this state of fear and say to them, oh, no, I can't go that, I'm afraid of dancing, right? And I'm not really afraid of dancing at all. I'm afraid of how people will view me when I'm dancing, which is a totally different fear. And so most of the time what we find ourselves doing in our lives is actually allowing things to happen in order to avoid other things. So what my suggestion in this case for you is to allow yourself to have a look at what you get out of if you believe men are going to attack you all the time. What can you avoid by believing this? Because, see, if you're processing an emotion over and over and over and over and over again, then it's not the cause. Yeah, and I, that's what I believe, because it's feeling the fear and nothing else happen. Yeah, I so, just, so I, therefore it's not the cause of your condition. There's something else going on. So ask yourself, what do I get out of holding on to my fear about this particular thing? What do I get out of it? How, what does it help me avoid? What can I get away with if I believe men are going to attack me? But the thing is, usually when that's happened, it's not when I'm in a situation with someone. It's just, it just comes. Yeah, you're feeling it a lot from spirits, I feel. Yep. Probably. But, but it doesn't matter who it's coming from. Oh, uh, yeah. The same thing needs to, the question needs to be asked. What do I get out of, what do I get out of believing that men are going to attack me? What do I get out of that? And you might get out of avoid, what you can get out of it is this. I can avoid every relationship with a man. I can avoid being open and vulnerable to a man. I can use my fear to justify all of these other things. And sometimes that's what we do and we need to notice that happening within ourselves. However, I am getting off the topic of what I wanted to talk about, which is this issue of why we reject truth and how this relates to judgment in particular. Thank you. All right? So let's talk about... Can I come in there quick? Can I just say, there is a saying, it's fear knocked on the door, faith opened it. Guess what? There was nobody there. And what's your point? That's, that's it. The, you, fear, the fear of the unknown. You're not using the microphone. Sorry, you, you've got the fear of the unknown until you face it. And it's gone. That's, that's very true, but all fear is emotional anyway, so you need to look at what's going on with your fears. Like, but you need to certainly face them all. Face them. Certainly, yeah. I'm not saying you don't need to face them. Am I? Okay. <laughs> all right. Yeah, can we have a mic over here, please? Um, I'm just a bit stuck. Um, so if you're, if you're in your error emotions, mm -hmm. How do you even recognise that there's truth out there? Like, if you're rejecting truth, but how do you know it's truth? Um, the truth is always without pain. So whenever I'm in an error-based emotion, I'm, there's always pain and suffering associated with it. So as soon as I actually get into the truth-based emotion, there will no longer be that same pain and suffering associated. So, so could you say that whenever I'm feeling pain, then there's a truth I'm not seeing? Yes. And that's telling you that. The pain is telling you that. The suffering is telling you that. Now, I'm not suggesting, though, that it's the pain of the emotional release. Because obviously, when you're in an emotional release, you are releasing the pain. So obviously, during that phase, you will feel the pain. 
but I'm talking about the pain where you stay in long-term pain without getting released, long-term suffering without it being released, then obviously there's a truth I am not facing and I'm refusing to face emotionally within myself. Does that make sense? And that would mean that your law of attraction wasn't changing. That's correct. Your law of attraction is, is the measurement by which we know things will change. So the, the, the issue that many of us face is that we start processing emotion, but we seem to process the same emotion. So, 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 you, so you start processing one emotion, let's say it's an emotion of unworthiness or something like that, and then every single day you seem to feel unworthy and, every, and nothing seems to change. Now, if nothing is changing, you're not dealing with the cause. It's quite simple, right? If nothing's changing, you're not dealing with the cause, you're dealing with the effect. So you need to look deeper into the cause. What I've had to do a lot is to look at myself a lot more honestly in those situations. And what I've found is we often use our fear as an excuse to not feel the cause the causal emotion, whatever the causal emotion is. Remember, it could be shame, it could be unworthy. Let's replace that and call that the cause or the causal emotion. The, pain, the causal emotion being the emotion that creates our law of attraction. Right? And, and if I refuse to feel that, I will never ever release that emotion from me and that will be the creator of my law of attraction. So. I could actually decide inside of myself that, that if I can stay in this state and justify to myself the reason why I don't want to feel that. And that's a very damaging place to be for yourself. Never justify your own fear. Never justify your own anger. If you justify your own anger and justify your own fear, you are never going to feel the underlying causal emotion that creates your law of attraction. Does that make sense? And when I say justify it, I don't mean don't feel it. I mean stop telling yourself that it's just, that it's right, and have this righteous rage. You know what I mean? We need to stop doing this righteous rage thing. We need to feel that it, we're allowed to have rage, we're allowed to experience the rage, and sometimes you need to, because a lot of it is childhood buried rage that you need to release, and a lot of it's childhood buried anger and also childhood buried fear. We need to experience it, but don't justify it and live in it. That's what we need to stop doing. Now, what often happens is because we now are in this state where we refuse to feel the causal emotion and we justify using some technique, so many times it's intellectual denial, or, which is really just covering over the emotional fear of the emotion. Because we're in this state, we reject the truth out of hand. Like, whenever the truth comes to us, it's just rejected. And when we're in this state, we are going to automatically feel that any truth that hits, you, hits us is judgmental. Does that make sense? So while you're in this state where you're refusing to feel your own causal emotion or justifying through fear, terror or anger or rage or any of those other justifications that we'll have to not feel this causal emotion, what we're actually doing is we're creating a permanent state of judgment towards every bit of truth that comes our direction. And this is a very dangerous place to be if you want to progress, that is. Because in this state of judgment, you can turn anything good into something bad and justify your not receiving it. Does that make sense? Anything. You can turn anything. Like, somebody comes and gives you a gift. You have a causal emotion to feel about it and you don't want to feel about it, so what you do is you have a judgment. The causal emotion might be, oh, it's, it's wonderful to receive a gift, uh, but I don't believe any gift has any, has, has, is given unconditionally. Let's say that's the emotion inside. And so what I do is I'm given a gift. The person who's giving it is giving it without any conditions, and yet I get the gift, 
and I go, hmm, I wonder what they wanted. How did I come to that conclusion? That might not be what they... They might have had a pure desire to give me this gift, right? And yet I'm going, what do they want now from me? What am I doing? I have just judged their action because I refuse to feel my causal emotion, which is any gift has attachments to it. My belief inside of myself that any gift has attachments to it. Does that make sense? Uh, microphones, please. Always microphones so that we can record this. And that's, uh, that's because one's making the external world responsible for the internal world? Um, not just making it responsible. They're making it to blame. Be, yes. To blame. Yes. So, uh, yeah, they're so basically... So they're not taking... Uh, one's not taking responsibility for what one's feeling. They're making their external world... Yeah. yeah, yeah. So my causal emotion is no gift, in, in the example I gave, my causal emotion is no gift ever comes without attachments. So in other words, I have no belief in unconditional love inside of myself, right? And many of us grow up like this, right, where we have no belief in unconditional love inside of ourselves. And so what do we then do? We project to the world, nobody out there is unconditionally loving. That's what, and so we receive the gift and the person who's, give the, you know, who's given it may feel like total unconditional love for you in the gift and yet you're going, oh, I wonder what they want. And you've got this negative judgment going back out at that person, by the way. It's a judgment of that person saying that person, is in, it's impossible for that person to be unconditional with this gift. That's what you're really saying and that's a judgment of the person. Peter? And they're not understanding the law of attraction either. Not at all. No. There's a lot of laws they're not understanding when they do it. Yeah. Where does personal truth fit in with actual truth? Um, well, personal truth... Uh, the problem with personal truth is that it could be error. Whereas actual truth is God's truth, the absolute truth, which is never in error. Now... So-called personal truth will often still cause no change in the law of attraction and cause pain to ourselves. We can live in personal truth and still be in a state of pain because that personal truth can't, might not be error. It might not be, sorry, truth from God's perspective. It may be error. So the problem with living in, like in all the New Age philosophies say you've got to live in your personal truth. My feeling is you've got to live in your personal truth except when it's causing you pain, because it's telling you that your personal truth is actually error. Right? And the only way to know the difference is to feel the pain, to feel the law of attraction, and allow yourself to feel what's going on in your life. Feel what's happening. And if you understand the law of attraction like that, you'll see every event as a law of attraction. You sit down to have a chat with someone, you get bitten by a mosquito, law of attraction event, right at that moment, going on, Something inside of you that you were denying, what was it? It's probably related to the discussion you were having. <laughs> you know, all of those things. The law of attraction is so precise. And myself and Mary often sit down to go, wow, how precise was that? In terms of right down to the specific detail and time. The actual moment we had a feeling pass through as many times the law of attraction brings us something, right? It's so precise and we need to understand that. But getting back to the judgment... Can you see the, what the creation of judgment is inside of yourself? It basically comes from a refusal to feel the causal emotion. And the refusal to feel the causal emotion is then justified by using fear or terror. We justify our terror, we justify our fear, and then we often get into a state of anger, rage, resentment, hatred, or whatever. And then we project to the world that it's impossible for anybody who does anything uh, nice that in the case of a causal emotion that I don't believe in unconditional love, anybody who does anything nice for me always had an ulterior motive. Right? Now, in that state, I can use so much intellectual reasoning to justify my perspective, most of, it, most of which is totally illogical. Like, I have heard so-called logical arguments over and over again. And the total illogicalness of the logical argument, if there is such a word, is outstanding in many cases. And the reason why that is the case is because once we're in this state of judgment where we're refusing to feel our own causal emotion, we are going to blame the world for everything. 
that's going on in our own lives. Right? And not take any personal responsibility or personal um, acceptance of what is actually, actually happening and going on for myself. So, somebody comes along and says, uh, AJ's narcissistic. How do you spell that? Uh, narcissistic? S, S, something like that, right? Anyway, uh, right, anyway. You know, I just get a Let, Let's. So, what does that mean? It means that I love myself to the expense of everyone else, that I'm self involved, um, that all I want is self glory, some people to notice me, and all those kind of things. Now, they say, they. This happened to me last week. They emailed me telling me I was narcissistic because I was saying I was Jesus. Now, that's a big logical step to make. <laughs> Just because you're saying you're Jesus, all of a sudden it means that you're self-involved? No. Well, how did that logical step get made? That logical step got made because of the refusal to feel a causal emotion inside the person themselves. They, this person who emailed me this doesn't even know me, has never met me, has never seen me personally interact with any person aside from what they've observed in one or two DVDs. And they've made the judgment that I'm narcissistic. And the truth is I could be. Couldn't I? Right? But they've made the judgment based upon this refusal to feel a causal emotion inside of themselves. Right? Mary knows I'm not narcissistic, otherwise she couldn't even live with me, right? <laughs> so, 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 so something's going on, and that is that there's obviously this presumption that just because I'm claiming to be somebody who they feel lives somewhere else, right, that means then I must be narcissistic. Does that make sense? So there's a straight away a big judgment coming out of them to me specifically. And does it really matter what, uh, you know, what's coming from outside? Is it more important for one to just feel what's happening within self when, when somebody's projecting? Yes, very much so. so. So when this person sent me this email, what do I feel? I go, wow, that's amazing. Like, let's go and work, look up narcissistic in the dictionary. <laughs> Oh, yeah, no worries. that's what I thought it meant, you know. <laughs> wow. Like, my, the, tr the truth is at the moment I'm going through these terrible emotions of having no worth whatsoever, and then somebody tells me that I'm narcissistic. Wow. And it's just because of me saying that I am Jesus. Right? That's, that's the only reason why they called me that. Right? There's no other reason. So... There's got to be emotions. Now, for me, what do I do then? Do I go right back? No, I'm not narcissistic. What's the point in doing that? This person is already making a judgment that I am. Do you think they're going to change their mind by dealing with their own causal emotion about my comment? So when I first made the comment to you, I'm Jesus, many of you felt your causal emotion, which was, oh, he's now saying that he's perfect. Or he's now saying that, you, I've got to, that I've got to listen to him. Or he's now saying, do you know what I mean? There's a lot of things we then assume. And I'm not saying any of those things. I'm just stating the fact that I am. Does that make sense? No, I'm not saying what you've got to do with that. I'm not saying what you must, you must follow me or anything like that. All I'm doing is just stating a truth. Right? And, and I'm not saying to you, follow me, you know, do what I tell you to do. Let's go and make a cult together and all these other things, right? And many of you have learnt that over the two years of time you've known me, right? But initially, when you heard those words, I bet those thoughts went through your mind, yes? Oh, yeah. Of course, many of those thoughts went through your mind. The reason why is because when we hear something, when we hear, and let's say, you don't know yet whether this is a truth or not, but I'll say it's a truth, right, for the moment. When you hear a truth, my refusal to feel my own causal emotion about it and my desire to stay in fear and anger and whatever other emotions about it instead, which are, which are 
a way to get away with not feeling this cause and emotion, causes then me to judge that truth as error without having any, any evidence whatsoever that it is error. And what we then do is we then start trying to construct evidence to support our opinion. Right? Sorry, you need to flick it up. And convince everybody else that what we're saying is the truth. Yeah, and that is one of the things that proves to us that we're still trying to do this, right? As soon as I'm trying to convince you that it's true, then straight away, why do I need to do that? I'm not trying to convince you it's true. You can believe what you want. You don't, you don't have to believe I'm Jesus, right? But then if someone gives them more evidence, it's almost like they say, don't confuse me with the truth, my mind's made up. Exactly. <laughs> That's really what they are saying. Don't confuse me with more truth. I have already got a refusal to feel my causal emotion. Don't try and make me feel my causal emotion. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to come up with all the reasons I possibly can to help me so myself avoid this causal emotion. And they'll come up with this evidence and that evidence and this evidence. And what happens after a while is there's not enough evidence even to stop them from feeling... The... So what they do then is they start constructing evidence through lies and innuendo and other things like that, right? And then all, there's all this stuff that goes flying out there as truth that when you trace it all back comes from nowhere. Like last week, apparently, apparently my father is dead and I wear his pyjamas. Now, my father would be really interested in that because he's alive <laughs> and he doesn't wear pyjamas. <laughs> Where did I put my... AJ. Oh, sorry. Taking that to another level, does yep. that mean if our emotions are so suppressed and... and we um, are not having all of that um, anger and fear, so we're not, we're not throwing out judgment. But does that mean intellectually we're s accepting the truth, but emotionally, at, at the soul level, we're not accepting the truth? No, when your emotions are suppressed, you are automatically throwing out judgment. This is happening at the soul level, whether you intellectually think you're, you are or not. You see, this is the problem with the intellect, is that once we get to this stage where we want to reject the causal emotion, from that moment on, we are now projecting to the universe judgment of any truth that comes to, that, to expose that causal emotion. We are going to judge it as beneath even our notice, which is a very easy intellectual way of getting out of very deep emotions. But even if um, um, you, I'm not, you don't make those judgments, and because the causal... Can, can I say, can I just stop you for a sec? Yeah. Understand you're already making the judgments. They're already being made at the soul level. And, and you don't know that you're doing it. You don't even know that you're doing it. Yeah. Right? So you don't even know you're doing it. Judgment is not a voiced opinion. Judgment is an emotional feeling. And you're already doing it when you're in this state of denial. So is that why you made the statement that there was nobody on earth that, at soul level, believed the truth that you were saying. Yeah, that's right. So when I say I'm Jesus, none of you yet have fully processed emotionally the causal emotions about that statement enough to not have judgment about it. All of you have judgment. And you, the proof of the judgment about it is that you look at your law of attraction. How many people do you get saying to you when you go along and say, oh, you know, I'm going along to these sessions and, uh, and they say, oh, what's it like? What's the guy's name? Oh, but, but I've got to tell you, he's saying he's Jesus. Now, can you feel your own judgment of that? Like, how many of you feel, right, lots of judgment in that? You know, you, you're afraid of what that other person's going to think of that now, aren't you? Most of the time, yes. There's very few of you yet who have actually dealt with that. And so... What that's saying is that there's a causal emotion you're refusing to feel. It's got nothing to do with me being Jesus, by the way. It's got everything to do, in many cases, of you feeling like you will then get judged or you will then get treated as if you're an idiot or whatever. And so, so it's got nothing to do with me making the statement. It's got everything to do with an emotion inside of yourself. And so what we finish up doing is we then respond in our own judgment. 
And the way we do that is we actually start treading around lightly the issue that we don't want to say. Does that make sense? So somebody comes along and says, oh, why do you go Monday nights down in Brisbane? Oh, well, there's this guy, I see. see. Uh, and what's his name? Oh, his name is A.J. Miller, you know? And then what does he talk about? Oh, love and truth and all these other things, right? And, and, and then you start to feel the feeling, how much information should I give them, right? I don't know if I should give them much more now. Like, I'd rather they come along for themselves and check it out for themselves before I give them much more information. Why is this? Because you're already in a state of your own judgment of what's going to happen. And what, that might not happen at all, but you are already in the state because there's a causal emotion inside that I'm unwilling to address. And the causal emotion might be, they will think I'm crazy. They will think I'm an idiot. They are not going to listen to me now. They are not going to treat me now like I've got important things to say anymore just because I'm thinking this or just because I'm going along there. There could be 50 causal emotion or reasons why I can't state the truth. Does that make sense? Easily. Yeah. So in other words, we are majorly um, addicted to pain and suffering, really. When we're not in truth, we are living on our addiction Yes, and yeah, unfortunately, tourism. we are so addicted to pain and suffering that, that we, we justify pain and suffering. Mm. Like, so, so when somebody says, oh, you know, like, quite often you hear people talking together, how are you? Oh, oh I'm, I'm feeling really bad today, and I've got this pain here and that pain there. Did you go and see the doctor? Yeah, and it's, it's this and that. And whole conversations occur around pain and suffering now, right, don't they? whole conversations and many people, many of you in the past may have been addicted to these kind of conversations too. And why do those conversations exist? Because they wouldn't even exist if I was actually feeling all of my causal emotion. Why do they exist? Because I am refusing to feel my causal emotion and I need something to justify that entire process. Right? And so what I finish up doing is constructing a whole system of pain and suffering that we now accept as real and realistic and what do we call it? What's the word I'm looking for? We think it's the normal thing on the planet. And we start saying, we start saying to ourselves even that no, what AJ is talking about is just utopian dreams and what is normal is what we've got. You've, I have, quite often hear many come up to me, say to me still, we've got to live in this real world. What real world, right? This isn't the real world. This is the world that we constructed to avoid our causal emotion. That this whole world is like that, really, constructed to help us avoid this causal emotion. And while I'm in that state of avoiding my causal emotion, I have automatic judgment of any truth from entering my soul. Does that make sense? Um, around that subtle area that you talk about where we're putting out judgment on the soul level, is this where autistic children pick that stuff up and really act out and sensitive people pick all this stuff up? Autistic children are like are antennas for this yeah. stuff. And so an autistic child is just sitting there getting huge amounts of judgment from the rest of its universe and, and it, and it hasn't, hasn't got enough space left inside of itself because it's so sensitive to feel its own self. It's just feeling every single thing, hammering it from its environment. And, and it's because we've constructed this environment and it's become normal that we now live in this place. You can't yell out and, get, and expect to get heard so I'm going to go across to Soraya. No, 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 no. Microphone across to Soraya, please. Right. Um, there was a couple of things I wanted to, um, to ask you about. And one was um, when people justify their illness and suffering oh, it's genetic, or oh, my mum had it, my grandmother had it, um, and also uh, old age. It's just getting old. That's yep. what happens when I get old, you know? <laughs> yep. Mm. And what's the question? 
Oh, actually, my question wasn't really about that. It was okay. about... Um, <laughs> sorry. It was about... Oh, it's just something I've noticed a lot of clients just say to me um, when they come in with uh, body pains. Yep, yep. Uh, and, I, and I start talking about um, emotions that are going on in their bodies and so on. It's a bit difficult for it to sink in. Yeah. Um, now, with the judgment... Um, I, I've got to a place where I think, well, I can see myself. I almost judge without my permission. You it judge happens. without your permission? Yeah, without my, my conscious permission. Now, Soraya, some... this is not true. You've got to stop telling yourself lies like this. That, that's what it feels like you to me. You can't judge without your permission. <laughs> my conscious permission? Without my conscious permission? It has your conscious permission. Oh, okay. You, like, so I when... judge all the time. Well, that's, that's great to acknowledge, right? So we firstly need to come to acknowledge that we judge all the time. And of course, all of us are judging all the time at some level because whenever we refuse to feel one of our causal emotions, we're automatically then now judging everything around us. Yeah. As, so yeah. do you understand that it is with your permission? At the soul level, oh, you the don't soul level. want to at the feel... Soul level. No, yes. no, no, consciously... Consciously as well, you do not want to feel the causal emotion. Okay. So, so the judgments that rise instantly in you, notice them. Mm, that's what is my next question. That's a good way of going, working backwards. Notice the judgment and go, okay, let me follow that back yes. to the causal emotion. Yes. That's cool. Yes. Because, because when you have a judgment, there's an automatic sign mm. that you have a causal emotion you're in denial of. So mm. it's like a signpost going, hitting you in the face. Yeah, so it's almost like one of those law of attraction events, but it's, it's quicker. Yeah, that's right. So, you do, so whatever you're doing, like so you might see somebody walking along the street, she's got a mini skirt on, right? And her boobs are just popping out a bit, right? <laughs> and you make a judgment. What's the judgment you make in that particular instance? You're a strumpet. <laughs> you're a what? <laughs> I didn't get that one. <laughs> a strumpet? I don't understand that one. That, is that a Queensland thing? No, it's an old-fashioned, old right, okay. Is that like an extension of crumpet? Oh, and yeah. you know, I don't know. <laughs> but yes, like you make this judgment based on her appearance of who she is in her character and nature, do you not? Many times we do, yeah. right? So, all right, we made a judgment. The judgment is already out of harmony with love, mm. right? So let's trace it back. What causal emotion don't I want to feel in that judgment? You see? That's what we need to go for. Well, firstly, we might firstly go back to the way to trace it sometimes is trace it back to the anger that you had in the judgment and then trace it down to the fear that you had in the judgment and then you might get to the causal emotion. Does that make sense? There will always be a path you can follow back to there's an emotion in me that caused me to make that judgment of that person. And by the way, whether it's a judgment of that person or yourself, it's still as damaging in both cases. So whether you judge yourself or judge another, you still damage yourself or the, or the other either way. Does that make sense to everyone? Uh, Jen, can we go over back there? Um, is assumption the same thing as judgment? Is it the same when you... You, yeah. sh you assume you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will talk about in a minute how you can know for certain, which is a whole different thing, right? What we want to do firstly is just look at this issue of judgment and see it as an emotional issue. Does that make sense? We want to see it as an emotional issue because it's the emotional, it's the, actually, it's the effect, right? of our denial of causal emotion. Judgment is always the effect of denial of our causal emotion. And so if we see it as such, we will then start seeing our judgment as not something to justify and laugh about, but rather something to help us find our deeper causal emotions. If we have a mic over here. Um, being a judge, judging someone is, uh, you know, for me, I sort of find that I catch myself out for sure. Sure, yep. But where I, I really struggle with is the feeling of being judged. Right. It, 
it's a very different. It, I just sort of shut down. I guess is really what I, what I find. Yep. I, you know, I feel anyone that says something to me that I'm feeling judged, I either go into you know the defence or the, or whatever. But it's it's a lot harder um, to go. Down, I find to go the causal thoughts. You know, to understand co the causal emotions behind that. I guess. Oh, behind the judgment. Mm. Yeah. Um, what I would like to do is talk about that as a separate issue in this discussion. Because what I want to first look at is the, is the emotional reasons why we judge others. And then you'll find linked to that is why we actually don't like being judged ourselves. Right? There is very strong linkages between these two relationships. And so um, oftentimes what happens is we have very little um, resistance to judging others, but we have huge resistance to somebody judging us. Does that make sense? And, and what we want to do in this state is actually stop having resistance to any of that. And what we want to do is allow ourselves to feel the judgment we have of others and start looking at the reasons why we do. But we also then want to feel why we think it's more important or, or more damaging when others have judged us than we do when we have judged others. Now, in the first century, I said it's better for you to not judge another person um, then, then, because what would happen is it, it would be the same. It's the same as it would be better for you to not judge than to have a millstone put around your neck and cast into the sea, basically. And what I was basically saying is, judgment is such a powerful tool of harming another person's free will that you can actually cause the death of other people just through judgment. Right? Now, I've actually been on the receiving end of that. I was actually told at one stage in my life by three men who met with me while I was going through some emotional experiences with my ex-wife that they said to me that it would be better if I killed myself than broke the marriage. That's what they said to me. Right? Now, that's pretty big judgment, isn't it? Now, if I, was in a if I was in a worse emotional state than what I was, and I was feeling really low about myself, I could have easily just gone and killed myself. That's how powerful judgment can be. You can actually cause people to die from it. It's such a damaging emotion. In the first century, I also talked about be careful that you, with regard to the rafter, I don't know if you know that parable. But I said, uh, take care that you don't look at others and not see yourself. And then I gave an illustration of how we often try to help the other person take something fault out of, out of themselves, which is like a little, a little piece of straw in their eye. And all the while, we've got a great big rafter in our own eye while we're trying to do it. So in other words, you imagine this great big rafter coming out of your eye and you're trying to see the little straw that's in Brian's? Like, it's going to be a bit difficult, isn't it, to extract the straw in his. And the problem with judgment is most of the time when we're in a state of judgment, we are actually in a darker condition than the people we are judging. Right? That's how powerful judgment is in your soul condition. So, so this is why it's very, very important to see judgment as a tool, a signpost, warning you that there's something inside of yourself that you're wanting to avoid. Can you see that? Joy, you'd like to? And then if we go up the back there. AJ, um, I'm just sitting here looking at the diagram. Can we avoid getting into the judgment by every little event that happens as a law of attraction? So like even if someone gives you a gift, so, oh, that's interesting, law of attraction. How do I feel about that? And do that process first. Well, the truth is that if you feel, choose to feel your causal emotions, you will never judge, right? No matter what emotions get triggered inside of you. But the problem is that all of us at some point have resistance to the feeling of a causal emotion, which creates automatic judgment anyway. But the key is to notice it. So I'm not saying, I'm not saying you, have, you don't have to be perfect yet. 
<laughs> because when I say yet, there is a time when you will become perfect. And that is when you become at one with God, you will no longer judge and you will feel every single causal emotion that passes through you the moment it passes through you. Right? It just and you makes have no me, resistance to it. It just makes me think that uh, we're looking at for the big law of attraction events, yeah. but not looking at our internal responses to the little law of attraction events. Well, uh, yeah, I feel you should law, look at every law of attraction event. Your, your entire life is your law of attraction, right? So everything, everything happening in your life, down to stubbing your toe and cutting yourself when, you, when you're cutting up the tomatoes, is all law of attraction events, right? And each one of them has an emotion that's being denied. So what we need to do is allow ourselves to actually to see those emotions. But why I'm bringing up this, uh, this judgment issue is because judgment is a very, very good indicator to you that you're denying some causal emotion within yourself. And it's a very easy one to see. It's a very easy one to see. So, so you know, you, you, often you're driving along the road, you look at something and you go, oh, that's a bit short, or, you know, with regard to the dress or skirt or whatever. Or you're, working, you're driving along and, oh, why are they like that? Or, wow, they're pretty fat. Whoa. You know, and you, drive, you, know, you make all these judgments, right? And these judgments all come from unhealed causal emotion within yourself. Because when you become at one with God, you will never judge again. And remember what judge is. Judging is a projection of my unhealed causal emotion on the world around me. It's, so judgment is emotional. This is why little children who can't even speak and can't even understand language still know what you feel about them. The reason why they know that is because it's emotion that's coming from you to them. And because it's an emotion coming from you to them, that it enters them and then changes their behaviour as a result. And that, if you think about it, is our entire reason why we want to judge, is it not? The entire reason why we want to judge is because we do want to change the external thing that we're judging. So if I say, oh, the political system of this world is really up to shit and whatever, and, you know, we need to fix that, I'm already in a state of judgment, am I not? I need to go straight into myself and say, all right, what's going on inside of me? All right, I've got, I've got some judgment about the political system of the world. What emotions in me am I avoiding that cause me to have this judgment? And I'll have some for sure. Right? And there'll be all sorts of things that I can access through this judgment. In the end, we'll get to a state where we don't judge, but we just speak truth. Now, this is where it gets very tricky because at the start, we're avoiding a lot of causal emotion within ourselves, right? So we are in an automatic state of judgment most of the time, right? And so then we feel justified in saying the truth. Like, we look at the person and they've got a mini skirt on and you can just see the bottom of their undies, right? And you say, that's just way too short, right? That's an automatic judgment, isn't it not, coming from my soul. What, now, why am I saying that? Because there's something in that situation that triggers an emotion in me that I don't want to feel. And I'm perfectly happy now to make her make her dress length longer. And you know, this is how rules got established. You know, in the 1950s and 60s, in the southern states of the USA, they made rules in all Christian churches of how long your dress had to be. Right? And many of you know that it happened here in Australia when you went to a Catholic school or something like that, and even to a normal school of how long your dress had to be, right? right? Now, how did that happen? It happened because some people had a sexual response to the dress being higher that they then felt could, they couldn't deal with inside of themselves. They couldn't deal with the causal emotion. And so what they did instead was make everybody change the dress length to that length to fix up the fact that they couldn't feel their shameful sexual emotion that they had towards these girls. That's what happens. Right? And this happens all the time in so many ways. And we've got to look at why this happens inside of us. Because in the end, we want to stop 
controlling every single person on this planet and give up control of every single person on this planet at, by our judgment. And what we want to do instead is choose to feel our own emotional response to it. That's what we've got to do if we really want to progress. So someone gets on the internet and they just blast Mary, right, out of the water. And half of you like Mary, right? Oh, all of you like Mary. Okay, okay. So, so, so many of you will feel very, very driven to defend her. You're making some judgments. Right? Straight away. Does that make sense? What kind of judgments are you making? Well, there's, a, there's all sorts of causal emotions you may be avoiding. Somebody you love is getting attacked. You then feel you need to rise to their defence. But this attack is actually a law of attraction event for them or for you in order to help you get access to a causal emotion. And maybe the causal emotion is unjustified attack. How does that feel for you inside of yourself? Doesn't it feel terrible when you're getting attacked for no reason? How does that relate to some events in your childhood? Ah, yeah, I remember my father come home one night and belted me with a stick because mum told him that I'd done something that my sister did. And that felt pretty bad. Can you see how we often are not healing those kind of emotions because of these actions? And so what we do instead is we feel drawn into defending our causal emotion, defending our castle. We feel drawn into it thinking that we're doing Mary a favour, but you're not doing Mary a favour or yourself one. In that particular moment, all you're doing is avoiding a causal emotion from your own childhood. Can you see the relationship? Sarah? Um, AJ, what I've found myself doing when I come across um, like a fat person or someone wearing short clothing or something, is because I, I know judgment's not good, but I can pretty clearly feel their emotions and I go into sort of empathy or sadness for them. Yep. But is that just another way of me avoiding my own emotions to just sort of, you know, feel their pain? Well, empathy is obviously a really good emotion to have for others in the sense that you, you can feel compassion for another person's situation, right? But uh, you feeling sadness is certainly something you need to look at inside of yourself. And the reason why is because why are you sad that they're making those choices? Right? There's something going on for you that causes you to feel sad about that choice. Does that make sense? And the key yeah. is to allow yourself to access that sadness. So yeah. use the event, law of attraction event, to access the sadness that you feel. Don't avoid the sadness. Right? So, so every single situation, when you think about it, is like a beautifully timed, beautifully constructed event that your soul has constructed for itself, for its own healing of its own causal emotion, including a lady walking on the road with too short a dress or whatever else, that's one of those events. And we need to actually look at that emotionally. It's God, God created us to all walk around naked in the end, didn't he? So, so we need to judge why we can't do that. At the moment, why we can't do that is because there's huge amounts of sexual projections coming out from everybody that's unhealed. And hardly anybody wants to heal them. We all want to justify them or we all want to say that, you know, they're there because well, I'm a male and I've got the, you know, the King Kong thing going on or whatever. And, you know, or I'm a female and, I'm, you know, I'm sick to death of being pushed around by men and now I'm allowed to embrace my sexuality. And we come up with all these explanations but at the moment, there's huge amounts of sexual projection on the planet and very few of us want to deal with the shame that's associated with the causal emotion of it. And we need to allow ourselves to get into it. We need to allow ourselves to be triggered through that. Can we go up the back there? Yeah. AJ, what I'm having a problem with is in my work job, how do, can I access these emotions after judging when you've got all these people around, I just block them and just block them. I, I just can't feel them. I'd end up crying, I'd end up being a mess. So I don't know what to do. 
Right, now, my suggestion is allow yourself to cry and be a mess. Now, that is not what is classified by the world to be a very professional thing to do. Agreed? Okay. So that's a judgment of the world that you're accepting. Can you see that? The truth is that anything that comes to me, including if I'm a practitioner, anything that comes to me is a law of attraction event to help me access my own causal emotion. So if I'm having an emotional response to a story that's being told to me, there is something inside of me that is connecting here that I need to work my way through. And the best time and place to do it is then and there. Now the problem that we face on today, in today's world is that we're going to be terribly judged as a practitioner if we do that. But we could say to our clients, I'm going to do this from now on. This is how I do my practice. And if you can't cope with me being emotional, how are you ever going to help me help you be emotional? If you can't handle me being emotional, I can't help you being emotional. I can't help you to get to your causal emotions either. I feel in the future what is going to happen is these kind of practices will change and instead of, not, instead of under the guise of professionality, being a professional, we suppress emotion. Instead of that happening, what's going to happen is being professional is being in your emotions at all times. And once we get to that state, all the nurses in the hospital are going to be able to do that. All the doctors in the hospital will be able to do that. Every single psychologist and psychiatrist and everybody else will be able to do that as well. And in the end, it will teach the entire planet that we're able to feel our emotions and our, that our emotions are the major cause of all of our distress and illness. So in this interim phase, you have a, you have a decision to make, really. And it's a decision based around truth. If you feel the truth that emotions are the cause of all disease, illness and suffering, then it's time to put that truth into action in your life, even if you're in a professional situation. And see where the chips fall. And allow it to change. Because at the moment, what happens is, if we all just conform to the way the world has already created this system to be, what's going to happen is it's going to stay the way it is. It needs people who are going to change it by leading their way through it. It needs leaders. Le people who will be examples in changing this whole system. So I understand the dilemma, but the feeling that I have is allow yourself to feel your emotions. Stop blocking the emotions. These are all law of attraction events bringing beautiful people to you to help you access some of your own emotion as well as helping them heal theirs, their emotion. And in fact, I feel that the more empathy that you have with them and the more you allow your emotions to flow because of what they're telling you, the more they will connect with their causal emotion and release it. Does that make sense? Sorry, it does, but should I at home feel the fear of feeling the emotion that I'm going to have because I have hundreds of people that I'm in front of every day yep. when I'm at work, not yep. just a few. So it's a huge amount of people. So that's the problem. I would have a lot of fear in the first place before even leaving home. Yes, so you certainly do need to feel that fear. The problem that we face in the beginning of any event venture that we make is that right at the start, we're basically opening ourselves up to hundreds of people projecting emotion at us, right? And that, of course, is going to have some fairly large emotional impacts on me, emotionally. What I need to do then is create a space for myself where I'm able to feel that impact and able to feel that coming at me. Many people who are in the professions of assisting others have learned to detune from their emotion in order to cope with the profession. My, the problem that we have with that is that we also then basically are telling our clients that they need to detune from their emotion in order to cope with their situation, by our example. But in addition, we're also telling every single person that we, we live with that we can't cope with the projection of emotion coming to us except by selection. And that is not the way to live our life and it's certainly not the way God created you to live your life. 
In the end, you will be able to cope with thousands of people projecting emotion at you and every single one of those emotions have no effect on you. But that will, that will only happen when you start allowing one or two or three people proje to project emotion at you and allowing yourself to feel it. And then as you feel it, you release the causal emotion and after a while there's nothing to resonate inside of yourself with that. So instead of you having to block it, you know, like, you know, the cross thing and keep it away from me, instead of you having to block it, what will happen is you'll absorb it, it'll just pass through you, but there'll be no response inside of you because there's nothing that it triggers inside of you. Does that make sense? So, but it takes courage, certainly, and there'll be fear, fear about being overwhelmed and fear about being, um, you know, manipulated and controlled even by other people's emotion. Lots of different fears will come up as a result. Yeah. And, and you need to give yourself the space to deal with it. For many people in, profession, in professional uh, areas that are, are caring for others, we, we, we don't have the space to deal with it and that's one of the major problems, right? And so that's why there's high degrees of breakdowns in the caring professions and so forth because none of them have the space to actually deal with their own emotional response to what's happening around them. And what needs to happen is that needs to change. But it needs people like yourself who are willing to lead that change for it to change. It's not going to change by all the doctors and all of the nurses and everybody getting together and saying, oh, we've all realised that we're doing this. Um, because, to be frank, the majority of them don't realise they're doing this and they feel like this is the only way to cope. It needs people who are willing to talk about it, talk about how to deal with it, and you'll find there's hundreds of thousands of people on this planet, hundreds of thousands of people in the caring professions who just want to do this. They want to be more open emotionally and everything. They just can't do it in the current environment. I'm going to have to change my battery, I think. So I'll do that. Who's next? This is a difficult question for me. It arises from what happened on the forum yep. regarding Mary. Yep. With a person attacking Mary, which I ju made the judgment of abuse. That, that this was an abusive situation after feeling the, nece the necessity to remove myself from, I didn't attack the guy back, just took a stand and drew a line in the sand for myself. Can I, feel, can I ask you though, did you feel anger? Profound anger. All right. Well, if you felt anger, then you were judgmental even though you didn't answer him back. And I went away and bashed the crap out of a pillow. Good, for good. For quite some time and had a real scream. But when I came back, the feeling of abuse of having drawn the line in the sand was still there. Um, Did you I, still feel angry about it? No. Okay. I then watched the forum. I was asked not to make a new forum, but then watched the forum for, the, for a period of time and the abusiveness didn't stop. My question is, when it comes to abuse, and I really don't know the answer to this question, I really have no idea. It's just so difficult for me. You've got to make a judgment that someone is coming at you and they're going to hurt you. Yes, they're all feelings, but you have to have some sense of self-protection, surely. And by... Oh. And by... Yes. You don't have to have some sense of self-protection. And this is one of the major problems that we face on the planet, is that because I justify to myself that I have to protect myself, what extent will I go to in order to do this? Well, I remove myself and have had no more... What if you can't remove yourself, Jen? I don't know the answer to that, AJ. I don't. Well... What I'll do is tell you the answer to it from God's perspective. And that is, 
the instant you try to defend anything inside, anything of yourself, including your own pain, you are straight away trying to prevent other people from doing what they want. And as soon as you do that, you're out of harmony with love. That's why I said in the first century, turn the other cheek. I meant that. That what that means is that there are some situations you're just going to have to accept right the way through to the end. Right? And the reason why is because you love. And when you love yourself and you love everyone around you, you no longer try to prevent them from acting in the way they want to act. Does that make sense? Now, if you can remove yourself from the situation, you would do so, obviously. But you don't try to prevent them or stop them from acting the way they act. Because as soon as you do, you are harming their free will. They are allowed to act as badly and as evilly as they desire. You don't see God coming down and grabbing them by the throat and pulling them up in the air and going, shaking them like this and saying, how dare you acted like that? Do you? God doesn't do it, so why do we try? If God didn't do it, it means that whatever God does, remember whatever God does is the most loving action. So the fact that God doesn't do it means that's the most loving action. So as soon as I step in and try to do that, I am now justifying, I'm really setting myself up above God in the, my actions to this person who is, a, who is a, also a child of God. Right? And I also, by the way, don't have enough trust in all of God's laws to correct the situation. So all we need to do is we need to personally act in harmony with truth and love and this is where I want to get onto the subject of truth because we need to talk about judgment in refer with reference to truth compared to in reference to pushing out these terrible emotions to everyone and trying to control them. But surely in the case of abuse you remove yourself out of harm and then take responsibility for what's been triggered. Surely you get out of harm's way. I'm going to put to you that there are going to be times in the future where people will not be able to remove themselves out of harm's way and, and have never even had a law of attraction event that would even encourage the thing to occur. Remember this, that whenever you are in a state of perfect truth, you are going to be in a state that everyone around you will judge as error. Right? And many of them may even attempt to kill you as a result of the truth you're in. And as soon as you try to act in a way that's defensive uh, about it, you are now in error. <laughs> And this is where everyone goes, oh, this is so unfair. This doesn't, this doesn't feel like love to me. Do you see why I'm a lot of people in the first century had a lot of trouble with my message? Yeah? Yeah. But my own example demonstrated exactly what I'm saying, didn't it? There were times that you cannot get truthfully out of a situation. And there will be times when other people will abuse you until you die. And yet, you will still need to stay in truth and love. And that's how much love will be coming from God to help you stay in that place. Does that make sense? So, whenever you choose to revile or to harm another person just because they're harming yourself or somebody else, we are straight away out of harmony with love ourselves. The truth is that the forum that you're referring to is at the moment being taken over by lots of very nasty spirits who are guiding people who are de denying their causal emotion to say things to you in order to trigger your emotions. And these spirits just laugh every time that you break one of God's laws in your response. Every time you break one of God's laws in your response, you just degraded your own soul condition and they go away and have a good joke about that. Does that make sense to everyone? That's what's all that's happening here. You need to see what is happening. And as soon as they do that, 
you need to look at yourself and go, okay, what emotion inside of me did I refuse to feel that caused me to be drawn into this transaction with these evil characters or evil spirits in the end? That's what I'm getting drawn into. And I'm getting drawn into it because of an emotion in me that I don't want to face. And if I can face it and heal that emotion, what will happen is that this whole forum will have done its good in at least healing a lot of emotions within each of us. I felt a desire come from my heart after I processed the emotions to do with abuse. I felt the desire to go to a new place, to not go back there, to face whatever they continued to do. I said nothing to anybody mm -hmm. about expressing my desire to create a new forum other than, you know, perhaps it's time for a new forum if you're interested. And that desire didn't go away. I don't know that I... No, that's not true. Jen, Jen I was it's asked yesterday, should a new forum be created? My answer was, I don't feel so. I have. I felt the desire to create a more loving space for myself in which to interact because I didn't feel it was right for me to go back to that place and interact with other people who were... So the question needs to be asked, why were you interacting with them who were like that anyway? Well, it... it There's a law of attraction event there I stopped you. talking quite some time ago. No, but, but now what you're trying to do is control who you talk to and who talks to you. But I have the right to do that. I have the right to control... I know you have the right to do it. You have free will. But would you do this if you were at one with God? Does God control all of those things? No, he doesn't. Then why would you? The only, can you see the only reason why I'd want to control it is because I want to avoid an emotion inside of myself. So what's the emotion you want to avoid? When you go to that forum, what do you feel? You feel attacked. You feel you're not allowed to feel your emotions. You feel like you're going to be criticised all the time. You've, so feel those feelings. They I just are, don't feel safe there. You don't feel safe. Another one of the feelings. So feel those feelings. They are the causal emotions creating this attack. Does that make sense? And as soon as you create another forum, what are you trying to do? Just to step out of your law of attraction and create another world that's not real. This is the world that's real. This is the world that's triggering you and you need to allow yourself to feel the emotion of that. Does that make sense? Now that, I know, sounds really confronting, but that's what I do with my life and that's what I'm trying to encourage you to do. James, can we go? What occurs to me with this too is the, you know, I can see very clearly the spirits influencing these people to come in mm -hmm. and while we don't deal with our causal emotion, we're open to the same group of spirits to influence us to buy into the same party. Totally, yeah. totally. So when you're sitting down there and you're reading this email that somebody sent you or this post on the internet forum that somebody sent you that's really attacking that you're, you're going into a reaction about, what's actually happening inside of you is at that moment the same spirits who created that comment come to you there's an energetic connection, an emotional connection between you and these spirits now, and they project at you all this stuff that makes you feel gooey and terrible and angry and frustrated inside and everything else, and we just go along with that. And then what we do, then we take the next step, which is type up a response that's resonant with those emotions that are actually emotions I need to heal inside of myself if I'm going to be loving. And it's a beautiful opportunity to heal them, but we just skipped over the whole thing, right? And every time I try to avoid my law of attraction on the issue, all that's going to happen from then on is what? I'm going to get another law of attraction event to trigger this emotion at some point in the future. You want to ask a question, Paula? Yeah, I think so. Um, so is it loving to... I mean, obviously I've been caught up in this forum thing too, and. I, I try to um, access the emotions as they come up, but I still feel, is it loving to respond to, to try to, when, when there's really incorrect information going out there? Um, how easy is it to get correct information? 
if a person really wanted to know correct information, for example, about my life, what do you think they would do? Wouldn't they ask me, perhaps ask my mum, my dad, my children? Wouldn't they do that? If they really wanted to know. The fact that they're not doing that means what? They don't want to know. <laughs> and if they don't want to know, then why are you buying into it? There's got to be an emotion inside of you of wanting justice, of wanting... Do you know what I mean? And, and wanting justice is just... Not, you're wanting firstly justice for yourself or for somebody else, maybe me or somebody else, but in the end you're also now projecting at them that they've got to, do, they've got to accept the truth. And they don't have to. They're allowed to lie about me as much as they want. They're allowed to have all this innuendo about me as much as they want. And I need to deal with my emotional response to that. And when I'm in a state of complete love, I won't feel an emotional response to that. I'll just feel like compassion for them, that they're in so much fear that they can go and believe a whole heap of untruths and just hold on to that and be in a rage about that for the rest of their life. I've seen people in their state in, for 2,000 years in the spirit world from my first century life. Right? And I see the terrible results of what they're creating and all I need to do is deal with my emotions about it. As soon as I go to give the punch back in return... I now pull myself out of harmony with God, out of harmony with God's laws. I'm no longer going to be at one with God in that state. I'm no longer going to be in a state of bliss. I've just broken laws of love. I'm just harming myself. So can you see why I don't respond to everyone? <laughs> like all I need to do is feel my feelings about what's happening. That's all I need to do. Nothing else. If I feel them and feel them fully and release them, I am going to get into a greater state of love with every single one of these attacks. Every single one of them. Just like you can with every single one of them. But you see what we do instead is we get into this anger, which is a denial of some fears, which is a denial of some causal emotions inside of ourselves, and instead we judge them, you terrible people, how dare you do this, you know, to, even to ourselves or to someone we care about and love, how dare they do this and all this kind of stuff all comes up. Now these emotions need to come up and be felt, but what's the point in hooking back into the person who created them for it? All you're going to do is just multiply them and before you know it, you've got this huge, huge thing going on of fights and bickering Where's the love now between anyone? It's all just gone out the window, which is exactly what these spirits want to happen. Right? That's all we're doing, we're just hooking into it as soon as we do that. So we're far better off just saying, all right, what a, I, I, I feel like I've got to respond. I feel like I've got to respond. Oh, okay, stop myself. Stop myself. What am I refusing to feel? What am I refusing? I'm getting attacked or someone I love getting attacked. You know, this is, this is bad, it's wrong, it's lies. It's like, what is it you're refusing to feel? In every one of those statements, there's something that you're refusing to feel. Let yourself feel it. Let yourself use it as a law of attraction event. So, like, I get a myriad of emails come to me about unsolicited emails from people attacking me, saying that I'm, you know, self-delusional, idiot who's narcissistic and, you know, unloving to everybody and, and all these other things. And all I do is let myself feel what that feels like to be attacked like that. And let myself go into whatever emotions come up as a result of that. Does that make sense? And if I can't feel it, I'll often engage so that some more attack comes so that I can eventually get to feel it. But aside from that, I will just feel it. And as soon as I have it come at me, feel it, and things change a lot for me in that space. And it will for you in that space too. Does that make sense? Yeah. And Josh, up the back, thanks. Um, I'm, I'm not really clear on my question, but I keep wanting to ask about our willingness to process emotions. Um, it just seems everything, every talk and 
my law of attraction keeps coming back down to my willingness. And, um, like, I don't know, this, when you're talking about uh, these situations where there's all these projections coming, which is getting more and more, um, and I feel that, like, I have a fear that I'll be at a state where I haven't got to a point where I have confidence and that emotionally I'll just run away. Like, if, if people are going to kill me and I, um, you know, have the opportunity to not be in truth, it's like I wouldn't think about it. I would just run. Yep. Um, and, like, I feel like that as a microcosm of my... My life is a microcosm of that at the moment mm -hmm. where... Uh, it's much easier just to run away um, and I find the moment that I have the desire come up inside of me and the prayer goes up to God okay what, what am I afraid of and then I'll start shaking and then um, then the intellect goes oh well, you've been processing for a little bit now maybe an hour let's have some ice cream and then <laughs> <laughs> yep. and it's just like I don't know. I'm just saying stuff, really, but I wish I could put it into a question. Um, can I ask the question for you? Yeah. Um, fear is dominating me. How do I get out of that state? Yes. <laughs> OK. Fear is the most difficult state to get out of, I feel. And there's only one way to get out of it. So if you can think, here's your soul, and your soul is full of fears and terrors, right? And my soul has got a lot of them too, by the way, still. And I've been dealing with fears and terrors for many years now, and so I've still got many. I've found the only way that I can ever get out of this state of fear and terror is to actually allow myself to fully feel that fear and talk to God, pray, pray, to, pray to God while I'm doing it. That's the only way I've been able to process my fears. I'm feeling a self-judgment about those type of fears and that, that they're not, they're being used as an excuse to avoid this, you know, like avoid deeper things. Well, Josh, there are two types of fears, and you're right. There are some fears that we use that we construct to avoid things. So when you know that you're using a fear, let's say you have a fear of telling the truth. So you know you're afraid of telling truth. So what you do instead, and this is where your mind can be used quite powerfully, is you start noticing every time you don't tell the truth, and you go back to that situation and tell the truth. So, so, for example, you walk away from somebody and you just realise, oh, I didn't say the truth then. So what you do is you turn around and you go back and force yourself to tell you the truth and right at that moment, feel the emotional response you have to that because it's that emotion that you avoided in your fear of telling the truth. Does that make sense? So if you confront your fears directly, head on like that, and whenever you find you didn't do it, go back and do it. You're allowed to make mistakes, but go back and correct them. So, so when you find yourself running away from situations, turn around and run back into them. Now, the fear you have is if you turn around and run back into them, that things are going to get pretty bad. They might, because that might be your law of attraction that needs to happen to feel your emotions more fully. But I feel at the end there is only one basic fear. And do you know what that is? I'm not sure. It's the fear that you will be overwhelmed. So in other words, we're all often afraid that if we confront our fears and, f and get into our causal emotion, that we'll be so overwhelmed we might go crazy or we'll go nuts or our whole life will get destroyed or I'll die. But either one of those things is just the fear of being overwhelmed. 
So if I know that fear exists in me, start talking to God about those fears. As you receive divine love, many of these fears will go away. As you receive, you'll process many of these fears. A lot of times it, like, it seems that I know what will happen if I take action out of something. Yep. And it's exactly what I don't want to happen, but I know it will happen if I, if I say the truth. Or Can I just say something? Many of you have already found that what you think you know after you did something, you realized you didn't know it? Have you found that already? Like, um, what I've found in talking to many people is that they know there's going to be a certain outcome, but they don't factor in the fact of these facts. And that is, every time you operate harmonious to God's laws and principles, outcomes are usually much better than what you could ever predict. It's only when you operate out of harmony with God's laws and principles that outcomes get worse. All right? Now, the only way you can ever test that truth is by putting that truth into action. In other words, taking actions that always are in harmony with love and truth and seeing what the results are. Like I've seen people totally surprised. They believed with all of their being that if they took a certain course of action, this result would happen. And yet, that result doesn't happen. Is Simon Denny here today? Like, Simon? No, he's not. Anyway, I, I just know, I, I know of a man, he, it looked like he was going to jail, jail for good, for a while, because of some things that happened. And he, he rang me up and he says, he says, what, he, he emailed me actually, he said, what do, what do I do? And when we talked in the next group, I just said to him, Tell the truth. Right? Tell the truth. And he says, what do you mean? I got angry with my mother. Yes. Tell the truth. You tell, say that to the judge. I got angry with my mother. My mother, you know, was drinking with me and whatever happened, I forget the exact circumstance that happened, and Simon got angry and eventually got this baseball bat, I think it was, and bashed the rear window of his mother's car in. And as a result, the his mother rang up the police and sent him to jail. Right? Now, I said, to, I said to him, tell the truth and see what happens. Right? And he was firmly convinced that he was going to be put in jail for, for, for a period of time, as was, by the way, the police who were prosecuting him, and also his mother, who wanted him in jail. Right? Anyway, he wasn't put in jail. But the judge was very surprised that he told the truth. And so surprised, in fact, that he felt the truth from this man, and in the end, as a result of feeling it, dismissed the case. Right? No, no, I felt that happen. And he thought that it was going to be totally the opposite thing occur. You see, he was judging it through his own pro personal experience before of how everything would go because of some unhealed emotion in him that he deserved to be put in jail, mum thought he deserved to be put in jail, the police thought that he deserved to be put in jail and all these other things, right? But what he did was he just told the truth and all the things that he thought ha would happen didn't happen. But even if they do happen, at least you've told the truth, which is still upholding God's laws. See, what happens when, when you do anything different is that everything in God's universe is actually against you. This is very important to understand. God's constructed an entire universal system based around truth and love. Every time you avoid truth and love in your own life, Every time you avoid living in that space, all of God's laws are against you. Right? Now, I don't know about you, but I'd rather have everyone on this planet against me and all of God's laws for me. That's my personal opinion. And the way that you can do that is by bringing yourself in harmony with God's laws and principles, not not listening to your fears, but rather confronting them and dealing with the underlying emotions. And when you do that, what will happen is that all of God's laws are now working for you. And in addition to that, 
every single one of the spirits who are connected to God's laws in the spirit world are also now working for you. So it's like you've just got this great army behind you, even though you're an army of one facing the world. Does that make sense? And we need to remember these things when we go into the soul battles that we go into. Because remember, what's happening right now on this planet is a battle for your soul. That's what's happening. It's not a physical warfare that's happening. It's a spiritual one, a battle for your soul. And how you respond is going to depend on whether you grow in love or degrade in your condition into fear. How you respond is just the, your, how you use your will in this process. So my suggestion is understand, even though you may not completely, firmly believe it at this point in time, understand that God is a God of love and she has constructed all of her laws and principles to support you when you are in a state of love and truth. The only time that support cannot occur is when you're in error. That's the only time it can occur. And that's the time when we have most of our difficulties, honestly. So allow yourself to have some confidence in God and those principles. Yeah, I was just going to say, like, it's just hard to see that when, you, when where we are where we are now, like seeing the bigger things that yeah. we're going to have to face. Yes. They just seem... So it's always just good just to remember, just deal with what's going on now. Yes, go in the now, deal with the cause, but, but understand, I'm doing this because I'm loyal to love. I'm doing this because I'm going to be loyal to truth, come what may. And if come what may means me dying, then that has to come what may. If come what may means me being tortured to death, that, that's come what may. I am going to stay loyal to this truth. Now... Now, obviously, I'll have emotions come up to, when, when I'm in that state. Every one of these emotions that I release, I'll receive more divine love and eventually I'll get to a state of one with God and I will be able to do everything in harmony with God's laws and principles at that point without fear at all. I will just have no fear left within me. Just imagine that. Like, it's just an amazing place to be. Have to have no fear at all about any issue at all. Now you've got freedom, right? When you're in that space. And if you remember, that's where the goal is and all this stuff that we're going through right now is just the way to get to that place. Right? And so, yes, I'm going to have to confront this fear and, yes, I'm going to have some very unpleasant events through my law of attraction to confront some of my fears. Just like, you know, I got stung by the jellyfish this morning, which I felt was an unpleasant event. I'm going to have these unpleasant events continue to occur until all of these fears within me are confronted and released. Thanks for that. Yep. Yeah, just giving me more confidence. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of the jellyfish again... Um, I I was down Malula Bar Beach this morning as well and was in the water and thought about the blue bottles and the onshore winds and every day I sort of think about it because I spend all of summer swimming there in the mornings and um, I haven't been stung. And I hear everybody saying, oh, you know, oh, do you hear there's blue bottles in the water today and that? And I just go, oh, well, oh, well, you know, and I just keep going every yep. morning for a swim. Yep. Am I... And, and it comes up and I think about it and then I go, oh, well, I keep, keep going in the surf. But am I suppressing my fear and not letting... Uh, no, what's your law of attraction telling you? It's okay. <laughs> so why are you worrying about it? I don't it? know. There's still a, something every morning I go for a swim and there's boards with blue bottles, they're on the sand and, and you know, it, it, I just still go, oh... I still stop and think, oh, am I going to get stung? Yeah. But, of course, my love for, you know, being in the ocean is, is, 
if... But obviously you also don't have fears about being attacked and fears, like other fears, <laughs> right? Well, not from animals, obviously. <laughs> right. okay. but, but obviously your law of attraction is just, just enjoy your law of attraction, you know? <laughs> so if your law of attraction isn't bringing you something, don't sit there and worry that it's going to. <laughs> I'll keep attracting it, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you know, my law of attraction means that, I, like, every time I drive into town, I have a nice smooth run. Isn't that wonderful? And I worry about it every morning. <laughs> That's not much good. Like, enjoy it when yeah. it's there. Okay. I will. Yeah. I'll enjoy my swim tomorrow morning. Yeah. And then you might get attacked by a blue whale. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm just joking. <laughs> Suzanne, then, just straight back. I hate to keep coming back to a point but it's just driving me crazy. You were saying that it's possible to be in perfect condition and still be attacked, like you were in the first century. Yes. How does that fit in with the law of attraction? Does that mean the law of free will is higher than the law of attraction? Not at all. And the law of attraction, uh, in terms of how that fits in, and I've answered the question before, when I'm in a state of complete truth, what am I going to attract? I'm going to attract everyone who's in a state of error, am I not? Because they need to hear the truth. Now, how that interaction occurs may actually at some point be what you may call physically damaging to me. But when I'm in the state of truth, perfect truth, I don't feel it's physically damaging even if I die. I'm really blonde now. Sorry? I'm really blonde now. Because I still don't get how... Like if a law of attraction is, comes to you to completely reflect back to you your internal condition mm -hmm. and that creates all the circumstances around you, why does truth attract error? Truth, Because truth confronts error every single time. And the problem with error is that it doesn't want to give itself up without a fight. The, problem, the issue with truth is it never wants to fight. Right, so this is the one circumstance where being in harmony with God's law can still cause the law of attraction to be negative. But see, I didn't feel it was negative. Only you do. Did you not suffer at all? No. No, of course I did not suffer. Like, can you suffer no. when you're at one with God? Well, that's something I've yet to find out, so... Well, what do you think? Well, what would you logically think? Well, obviously, if you're at one with God, would you be suffering? No, ever? No. no matter what is happening to you? I guess not, if you say not. No, I'm saying you won't. Yeah. What I'm saying is that other people will think you are, right? Mm -hmm. And so this is the, this is the issue that, that is faced, that most of the planet face, is that we don't understand that when we're in this state of at one with God and when we're in a state of perfect truth, we're not in a state where we'll ever suffer from anything. So everything that you judge as a suffering situation, I will, and every one of you will eventually look at, upon as that's not a suffering situation at all. Because you're now in this state where you're at one with God. You're constantly connected to God exactly as God intended. You now know everything that's going on. You know all the truth of everything that's going on. You know even how to control your own physiological functions. Everything. Well, you know, many of you know that people in, um, like India can slow down their heart rate so much that they can be put under water for an hour and still come out breathing. Right? You've heard of these things occurring, right? Many of you also have heard that you can not eat for two, two years and still survive. Right? Now, most of us couldn't do that at this point, right? because there's still emotions that prevent us. But after, when you're in this state of truth, you will understand how to control all of your physiological functions, everything going on inside of your body. You'll know everything that's happening around you. You'll know who's dangerous. You know what spirits around you are dangerous. You can see them. You can see how they're influencing every single individual around you. Do you think you're going to be in a state of fear in this place? Probably not. No. Okay, no. thank you very much. We're only in the state of fear because we're yet to release the emotions and we also believe this pace isn't possible. Mm. There's this deep belief inside of us, emotionally, that it's not possible to have what I just described. Mm. But intellectually we say, oh, that might be possible, but emotionally we don't believe it's possible because if, 
if we believed it was possible, we'd already be in that state mm. emotionally, right? Does that make sense? So <laughs> what you see as a negative event, my crucifixion, and what the Bible then has written in it afterwards of all this suffering that I went through and whatever else, all is untrue. Mm. Mm. Because it was all judged by the emotional condition of the people who wrote it and not by mine. Does that make sense mm -hmm. at the time? So when you see someone hanging up on a stake, nailed there, and you then put yourself in that situation, in your current emotional condition, yes, you would go through a lot of suffering, just mm -hmm. like I would right now. Does that make sense? Yeah. But when you're in a state of at one moment with God, that's not the case at all. Do you mm. see the difference? Oh, well, now mm. that you explained it, yes, I can. Thank so, you. so when you're in this state of truth, you will want to confront the error that's around you. It's not like you're going, oh, no, there's another situation to confront. It's not like that at all. You want to confront it because that's why you're even there. You, can, you know that's why you're there. You can feel that's why you're there because you want to confront the truth that's going on. And after a while, you enjoy that process even. Right? Yeah. Instead of shaking in our boots like we do now, you know, it's like, <laughs> oh no, there's another, there's another <laughs> event I've got to confront, you know. It's not like that at all. Yeah. Instead, we have a joy about it. Um, yeah, that comment kind of brought up um, something that's been residing in me uh, the last little while is, and I kind of would like to shine a light on some of the things is um, the hidden errors in some of our desires um, because when we're having um, a desire to, I suppose, be in truth and to receive God's love, but we're still wanting that love and truth for our own protection of our pain and suffering. And I just thought, yeah, that sort of resided in me and it's something I'm going through at the moment, so I sort of felt like yeah. to shine the light on those sort of Very things. Very good point. Now, why are we desiring a, a, a relationship with God? Is it for our own protection? Then it's a flawed desire. If, it, if it's just for our own protection that we desire the relationship. Yeah. It's like, it's like do you desire your relationship with your partner just because she cooks a meal from you every night? Wouldn't that be a flawed relationship? And it's the same with our, often we project to God these same kind of emotions, right? And we need to understand that that's actually, that'll be released from us too in the end. We won't love God just because of what God gives us anymore. We'll love God with all of our heart because that's this feeling that we have within instead. Can I get though that to this being judged? And by, by, I was going to have a break, but it's, but it's only like another quarter of an hour, 20 minutes and we'll be done. All right, so, so if you need to go and go to the loo, just, that's fine. Just, and I'll just keep going. Being judged. Most of us have terrible responses to being judged, don't we? Don't you feel just absolutely shocking inside of yourself when you're judged? All right. Okay, so what's happening inside of the soul? So here's my soul. I receive an emotion from my external world that I am lesser. Because that's what a judgment is, right? A judgment is saying to you that you're not as good as that person, me, these other people, all the people on the planet, whatever. Does that make sense? That's how we feel it. Enter it, isn't it? Far away. But the, um, when you get that, that um, being judged thing, that, that is given to you as a truth. Of course. Supposedly. Yeah, yeah, of course. Because anybody who judges you thinks that they're right. <laughs> Everyone who judges you thinks they're right. Right? So, yes, of course. Every time you receive a judgment, it will always come at you as if the, from the person who thinks they are, they are in truth. All right, so, so yes, they think they're true. Now, the key thing to do is to go into the emotion that you feel as a result of that judgment. So let's say the, the judgment is you're 
a narcissistic person. Now, that's the judgment coming at you. Right? In other words, you're self-involved, self-important, you have no care or love for anyone else, you're just like totally interested in your own welfare. That's what's being said to you. Now, if there isn't some kind of an emotion in me that gets triggered by that judgment, I'll just go, okay, won't I? And walk on by. It will have no effect on me whatsoever. If it has an effect on me, then it tells me that I have an emotion inside of me to release. So in other words, if my soul resonates in any way with the judgment that's coming to me, then that means that there is an emotion inside of me that I need to address. Now, it might not be the emotion the person thinks is the truth. It might be a completely different emotion. So in other words, if somebody says to you, you're totally selfish, and you have an emotional response to that, right? It might not be that you're selfish, it might be a completely other emotion that causes you to respond to that statement. And you need to allow yourself to feel the response. Because the problem most of the time is we don't want to feel that emotion, that causal emotion that my law of attraction has brought me, and instead what do I do with that? I don't want to feel it, so I don't feel it. Feel. And what do I do instead? I then create a denial of the emotion. I then go on the defense or the attack of the person who's projecting that emotion. Straight away, I'm out of harmony with love. Does that make sense? AJ, even in the denial, there's a feeling there, though. There's always a feeling. Yeah. So always. It's, it, but it's, it's like, it, even in the denial, there's the feeling under the... Yeah, the feeling's always there. Uh, the feeling's always there. So my choice to deny the causal emotion is always caused by another emotion. Yes. Yeah. So the emotion might be, I'm ashamed of myself. Because so, in the past, I did... I was... Yeah. Selfish. There could be a pretense that I'm not feeling the emotion, but the emotion is there. Always. Yes. The emotion is always there, and I need to allow myself to access it and be honest about it. When I try to go on the attack to what's coming in at me, now I'm no longer in this state. Right? Yes. So, and again, remember this is happening emotionally and not intellectually or by words. So, so the truth is. I can, I can sit there and write nothing, say nothing, and right at that moment I am just doing this as bad a thing as the person who just attacked me. <laughs> because I have this projection coming from me. <laughs> you know, like, I don't want it. <laughs> That's coming from me. And, and while I'm in this state, I am doing the same as what they're doing, which is projecting a judgment at them now for their judgment of me. So what's that doing? That's really like getting out a hammer because someone knocked you on the knee with their hammer. And then when they get out their machine gun, you get out your bazooka. And then when they get out their, you know, missile, you get out your nuclear warhead, right? And all of it is just because we denied our emotion. And a lot with that denial of the emotion is that there's not an expression of it. It's, there's a living of it within, and then that just seeds and seeds, and that can go on for... Forever, actually. Yes, It, it, it possibly right. yeah. can. Uh, it doesn't normally, of course, because by the time we hit the spirit world, we see them all and <laughs> start addressing them. But can I just go state a few more things, though, about this being judged and the difference between judgment and truth? Truth is stated without an emotion of judgment. Now, what does that mean? Someone can say to me, AJ, you're selfish. 
And that person can have no judgment of me being selfish. They have to be in a pretty good state to do that, don't they, emotionally? But they could have no judgment of me being selfish. In fact, they could have a feeling that they want to help me get through my selfish emotion. In other words, they could have a feeling of love towards me and a desire to assist me to get through my selfish emotion. Does that make sense? Or conversely, someone can up to, come up to me and say, AJ, you're selfish, and really what they want to do is, AJ, you are a selfish bastard, actually. You know, and they've got all this rage and anger and everything coming. Both of them might be stating the truth, verbally, but what's actually going on? What's actually going on is one person is stating the truth without judgment and the other one is just using the truth to judge. Right? Now, these both states enter me. Here's my soul. Here's my emotion. If I have an emotional response to whatever is coming at me, including the judgment, then I need to feel the causal emotion. It's the same thing. It's the same answer every time. Can you see that? I just need to address the causal emotion. Now, being judged is certainly a very harmful projection. So, when I'm a child and I can't protect myself against these kind of projections, and I'm shut down from feeling my emotions about these kind of projections, these judgments build up inside of my soul. And they get put one upon the other, upon the other, upon the other, upon the other. And before you know it, what's happening is you're now a living judgment of everyone in your environment. And you're now trying to pander to mum to do this and pander to dad to do that and pander to the, you know, the law to do this and pander to the environment to do that and pander to your workplace to do this. And you're making all these compromises because you're afraid of how you're going to be judged in the end and you're afraid of your underlying emotions that these judgments from your childhood is crea have created in you. We need to release these emotions so that, we are be so that we become totally insensitive to judgment inside of ourselves. Does that make sense? We will no longer feel... Pe like, people will judge us and we're going, oh, OK. That's an interesting statement about their... Uh, their own feelings? Wouldn't it be nice if I could help that person get out of that state? Now, there is a big difference between truth and judgment. And it, and it can be a big difference in exactly the same situation from an external perspective. And what I mean by that is, I can tell you the truth without any judgment whatsoever, or I can tell you the truth full of judgment. So, for example, I could say to somebody, let's say um, I have stated in the past that when we abort our child, we are committing a murder. So, if I wanted to state the truth with judgment, I could say, everyone here who's ever aborted a child, put up your hand. You are all nasty murderers. Couldn't I? And now what would that be? That is a terrible judgment upon you. Right? Because I have actually stated what I'm actually doing inside of my soul is I'm saying I'm better than you because I didn't do that. Does that make sense? And I'm saying that all of those people who didn't do that are better than you. And that's not the truth, actually. Right? So what we've got to do is come back to the fact that what is my reason for stating the truth? If my reason for stating the truth is to denigrate you and pull you down and make you feel worthless and make you feel terrible, then I am judging you and my soul is going to be judged in the manner in which I'm judging. That's pretty harsh, eh? Because if you think about it, if I'm going to be judged in the manner in which I judge others, wow, like if I'm going through others' lives with a fine-tooth comb and condemning everything that's in, in their life, wow, that's going to be pretty harsh on me when it comes to me and what happens with me. And what, can you see, the, you can see what's going to go on there? And this is the problem with judgment, is it creates such a poor soul condition 
inside of ourselves that in the end our own condition gets degraded so much that we can end up darker than the people we're judging. Right? And that's, that's the problem. And in fact, historically, the people who judged oftentimes ended up in a darker condition than the people they judged. Right? So, you will find in the future that people who want to know the truth, when you get into a state of less judgment, people who want to know the truth will just feel drawn to you. Because they know that you can, they can say the truth to you about their life and you won't judge them for what you did, for, the, for what they did. And that's a beautiful fact because God actually doesn't judge you for what you've done either. What God does is have compassion for you for what you've done. God's laws have already judged you, by the way. In other words, the, what you've done, you're already experiencing the negative effects of what you've done on your soul right now. Right? So whatever I've done in the past, right now I'm already experiencing the negative effects of it in my own soul. Does God need to do any more than that? Of course not. All God does is have compassion for the fact that we're in that state. And all I need to do is have compassion for the fact that you're in that state and all you need to do is have compassion for the fact that I'm in that state. Does that make sense? And when we do that, what we start doing is we start feeling the truth enter us and we stop going like this to the truth, you know, like, no, 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 I don't want to know more. That's often how we are with truth, isn't it? Like sometimes I come around to some of your places and after a day you say, oh boy, I don't know if I want to cope with any more of this, <laughs> right? And the reason why is because we have this resistance to the truth and the reason why we have the resistance to truth is because in our own soul we have a judgment of ourselves that, of this truth that we're receiving. We'll get to a point in the end where we don't have that judgment of the truth and instead all we do is we allow ourselves to feel our own emotions about it. So, in this discussion, what I wanted to illustrate was three main things, and that is, just because someone thinks they're telling you the truth about yourself, it doesn't mean it is actually the truth. That's number one. Secondly, when somebody does judge you, in other words, when they have an emotion coming at you that you are lesser than they are, Right? That's what a judgment is in the end. When they have this emotion coming at you that you are lesser than they are, they are actually in a state where they are not loving. And that is a statement of truth and not a judgment. And the third thing is that whenever you judge or are being judged, the answer in both states is to allow yourself instead to examine the emotion you're avoiding. So when I want to judge you and when, I want, and when I feel hurt by you judging me, in both states I need to go back to the causal emotion that exists in my soul. And if I do that, I will get eventually to the place where I will not judge anyone else and I will also finish up attracting quite a lot of people into my life who don't judge me. Right? And the beauty of that is that you start living in, in, in a lot of joy then. And a, lot of, and a lot of your life is joyful because of, as a result of it. So, is there any more questions about this point of judgment and truth? Or do you think it's done? You got a few more questions? So let's... AJ, could you speak about self-judgment? Certainly. Self-judgment is just as bad as judging another person. Because from God's perspective you are just as valuable as another person is. So every time you go into self-judgment, you are actually still avoiding a causal emotion inside of yourself. Can you see what I'm saying? What I'm saying is that every time you judge yourself, so every time you judge yourself, you are actually using that as an excuse to avoid a deep emotion inside of you that you want to avoid by this judgment. So the same principle applies as everything of us I've already discussed, and that is that is just as harmful to your own soul 
as judging anybody else is. Is it also possible that there could be spirits hanging around who are wanting that to happen? There, it's not only possible, it is a certain fact that when you're judging yourself, you will attract a whole group of spirits who want to hammer you. Yep, that's a certain fact. So is this a time for absolute will? Sorry? Is, is this a, a time also of absolute will of going into that emotion? Yes, so if you find yourself judging yourself, you say, oh boy, I see what I'm doing now. I see what I'm doing. What I'm doing is I'm just falling into this trap of doing the same thing that I always want to do, and that is avoid my causal emotion. I need to go deeper than this. So instead of berating myself, punishing myself, doing all of these different things that prevent me from getting into the real emotion inside of me, sit down with that and stop yourself from doing that self-judgment and get in instead to what's underneath, uh, uh, underneath that. So underneath that will be some anger with yourself. And underneath that will be some fear about yourself. Right? And underneath that, of course, will be some causal emotion you need to feel. It's the same process whether you're judging yourself or judging another person. And it's just as damaging. Mm. And yes, whenever you judge yourself, you invite a heap of spirits in who judge you as well. And whenever you judge others, by the way, you do the same thing. You invite a heap of spirits in who judge those people as well. Yeah. So it's like a heap of, you know, birds of a feather do flock together. That is the law of attraction. I guess as well, and in my own case, it feel, the self-judgment feels so old. It's been with me since in utero, maybe. Well, self-judgment um, always comes from a parent's judgment of you. Mm. So you actually accept the parent's right to judge you, and then you feel that you must have been to blame for them, and so then you start just repeating the pattern that your parents repeated with you. So in the end, you become your own damaging parent. Mm. Right? That's that, and that is the whole role of judging you when you're a child. The parent wants you to damage yourself so badly that you then fall into the pattern of what they've fallen into. That's the whole purpose of this in the end. It's to change your behaviour to suit the environment. Right? We need to get into the deeper emotions and once we get into the deeper emotions of that and grieve the judgement of ourself, so rather than being angry with yourself and, you know, and all that, grieve the judgement of yourself and allow yourself, pray about this judgement of yourself to release that. And as you release it, as you receive divine love, it will help you release it you will no longer judge yourself and you'll have some worth, you'll feel some worth inside of yourself. In the end, you know, many of you don't realise this, but when you are at one with God, many people around you will view you as arrogant. Because on this planet, it is a very, very rare thing, and in fact, nobody's ever really seen a person at one with God on this planet, and nobody's ever really seen on this planet a person who has a true sense of self-worth, right? And in the end, many of you will have a sense of that self-worth, and so therefore, others will probably start judging you. Like that. And what happens is this. They feel from your soul these beautiful qualities that come and overwhelm them, and that it then exposes the negative qualities inside of them. And then because of their own judgment of themselves that they don't want to feel the causal emotion about, they will want to punish you for that exposure. Does that make sense? But when you're at one with God, it won't matter to you that that happens. Thank you. And then I'll back. AJ, um, a while ago, as you were going through this, starting to relate it to, to the child, the effect on the child, I realised just how destructive this uh, projection of judgement by adults is. It's perhaps the worst thing that can happen. And, um, can you see why in the first century I said it's better for you to have a millstone yeah, tied around yeah. your neck and thrown into the sea yeah, than yeah. it is for you to judge another? Yeah, it, I see it, that. It is yeah. such a damaging emotion. Yeah. yeah. What, with your help, I managed to get beyond like the, the walking around tod toddler stage to earlier memories. The earliest memory I have before, after birth, I, I, was, I was a little 
just a little toddler perhaps sitting there just doing my thing, whatever it was, and I've got a vivid, vivid memory of what it felt like. I, I felt pristine, completely spontaneous, um, just at, more or less as I was created. So mm -hmm. it was clo very close to that. Yeah. And I've got a memory of feeling something coming at me, and I would now call it judgment, mm -hmm. but it was a, an emotion. There were no words. I had no words. Yeah. I could feel this. And I, could, I can remember feeling, wondering what this was. It didn't feel good. And I could feel myself coming out of this near pristine state into an ordinary state. Yep, yep. So it was like one of the first layers on that I, I, I would later have to unpeel. Yeah. You think, about it, you think about your lives right now, the main reason why you are afraid to do exactly what you desire is because you're afraid of how everybody else around you is going to react. Right? Isn't that true in most cases? Like, we're just afraid of how, and we're even afraid of how now how we'll react to following our own desires as a result of these projections. These projections are so damaging, they enter us at very, very young ages. Yeah. And this is why it's so important to start reversing it by actually getting to the causal emotion rather than doing extra damage <coughs> externally. Yeah. As soon as I get into judging others, I'm just doing extra damage to them. So when I see that lady walk past me with her short skirt on and I project at her that she's a whore or whatever other projection that I have that comes to my mind, and all of a sudden I have this feeling and I project that at her, I am just damaging that woman even further. Well, why would I want to do that? Like, she, she's already obviously had enough damage. Why would I want to do more damage to her? Right? So I've got to look at what's going on inside of me instead of doing this damage anymore. And this is why I wanted to have this discussion with you tonight. Because, because what I'm finding is that many... Many progress to a degree on the divine love path, but then they start getting attacked. And when we start getting attacked, what do we want to do in return? We just want to defend and attack in return. And, and we want to judge the people who are attacking us as, you know, aren't they an idiot? Aren't they stupid? Oh, look at them. Aren't they, they're not very, they're very you know, and we, we have all these judgments that are not coming from a place of truth but rather they're coming from a place of thinking they're lesser than us. And we are out of harmony with love as soon as we do this. And we need to, we need to see that happening inside of us. And when we see that happening, we can correct it. So that's why I wanted to have this discussion with you. So hopefully, uh, that's, uh, I'll, I'll finish it now, actually. And hopefully that's uh, covered a lot of uh, the stuff of judgment. Obviously there's a lot more to say about judgment uh, which we could bring up. But what I wanted to talk about in the future and some of these discussions are things like free will and desire and how free will and desire can be actually enhanced and developed rather than us focusing on the negative stuff coming from us and focusing even on our negative emotions all the time how we can start developing some of these really positive parts of ourselves in, in, in positive directions and, and still living in truth and in harmony with love doing that. So that's what I'd like to cover in the future a bit. But thanks for your time, guys, and thanks for your patience.